select board meeting for September 8th, 2020. Um, before we get started with our agenda this evening, Vanessa asked me if you could make a brief comment, so I will allow that. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just want to take a moment to say um, I am humbled and honored by the support I received um, in this recent election uh, and the results um, coming out of Tuesday. Uh, I am indebted and grateful to my family, my friends and colleagues for their love, their encouragement and their generosity over these last seven months. Um, to all the residents of Reading, regardless of how you voted, know that I am here tonight um, and moving forward in everything I do um, with a commitment to serve as a volunteer elected official here in Reading. Um, it's where we all call home. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so for this evening, you folks able to see the shared screen? Is that working? Great, thank you. Um, so just for the logistics, um, I wanna make sure that we're, it's been a few weeks, we're, we're back on track. So tonight we're broadcast on RCTV, Verizon Channel 33, Xfinity Channel 22, also available on Facebook Live, the link from RCTV and YouTube. For public comment, it'll be this evening at about 7.45. Um, this relates to public comment just in general, not specific to the public hearing that we're having this evening. Um, we've asked that people just send us an email indicating their, their desire to speak. And I know that we have, I believe, uh, at least one person that has expressed the desire to speak. Sorry about that. Um, I know that this is posted regularly, but just to be clear, please folks, any questions or about resources that are available, go to the town website, readingma.gov. You can send emails um, depending on the specific issue. If it's human or elder services, if you'd like to help, if you have general questions, you can also call town hall, 781-942-6680. There's a menu of options that will be there. You can leave your name and number. And as always, if ever it's an emergency, you should be calling 911. Tonight's agenda, um, we'll start out with a COVID-19 response. Uh, we have, uh, Carrie, sorry, I've lost you on my screen, but are you back? Okay. You are, gotcha, thank you. Carrie Dunnell from the Board of Health um, and, and Bob will speak briefly uh, in terms of COVID-19. Um, then um, Laura Jem will speak, give us an update on uh, elections past and future. Uh, we haven't done liaison reports for a couple of meetings, so uh, let's talk through uh, meetings that we've attended and any updates from those. We then have a public hearing scheduled at 7.30, so we'll open the public hearing. It relates to uh, Jay and Ricky Inc., so this is Ricky's Liquor and uh, requesting an alteration of premises that was in the board packet. Um, at the conclusion of that hearing, uh, we'll go to public comment. Um, after public comment, uh, we'll hear from the Climate Advisory uh, Committee, Sustainability and, and Master Plan, again in the packet. Um, sorry, there's kind of a, there was a duplicate in here. It says closed warrant at the same time as it said uh, sustainability. I've tried to cross that out as best I could. Um, tonight, we'll be discussing the warrant at 930. Um, and then we do have a deadline of 922, our next meeting to close the warrant. So we do have to do that as an as item of business at our next meeting. Uh, we'll have a discussion on uh, the stretch code bylaw, uh, a motion to, um, to vote for the board to uh, sponsor that. The Reading Coalition, um, I asked if they would come in and speak briefly about what they're doing, um, specific to a lot of the mental health focused activities that they've moved to uh, during this COVID period. And they're a great resource that the town has. And I think it's just a nice opportunity for them to say a few words about what they're doing and share the resources specifically with everyone. Uh, at nine o'clock, we have a discussion of the town manager goals um, for fiscal 21. Uh, again, uh, it was in the packet. Uh, we'll talk through where we are for that. 9.30, uh, Bob's gonna give an overview of the warrant for November 2020 town meeting. Uh, about 9.45, we have two sets of minutes that are in the, the packet. Would like to um, vote on both of those, approve those this evening. We'll talk about future agenda items and uh, that has us roughly on a, on a 10 o'clock timetable. So um, with that, let me um, ask uh, Carrie, first of all, maybe from the Board of Health perspective, you could give us a quick update. 
and I'll stop sharing and bring back the pictures. There we go. Mark, uh, could I ask a quick technical question? Sure, I'm sorry. Are we being recorded? I'm, I've become accustomed to seeing like the red recording, recorded recording button in a Zoom call. And it may just be that we're being recorded by RCTV, but I'm not seeing the, the red recording button. Caitlin, is that the situation? Yeah, you're being recorded by RCTV. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Carrie. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, in terms of um, uh, COVID-19, uh, the Board of Health uh, continues to meet. We've reduced our schedule somewhat. Um, we're meeting now twice a, twice a month, um, more if need be. Um, one of us is attending the regular command meetings and we'll adjust that schedule as need be. Um, the caseload in, in, sorry, in Reading is up very slightly. Um, and what we do know about that is that it, it uh, there are some instances of, of family cases. So, um, we're keeping an eye on, on, on what's happening in town and, um, you know, noting if there are any notable cases of transmission. And um, and I guess then I'll just say this morning I was at another meeting and um, um, right now we have some great news in that the Massachusetts hospitals, none of them are using surge capacity. Um, that's really outstanding. And the caseload, the seven day lagging caseload is as low as it has been at any point in the pandemic. And that's excellent. And hopefully, um, you know, people continue to use social distancing and, and face coverings and keep each other safe and over the holiday weekend. And, you know, we'll be able to continue that trend. The seven day caseload being a record low, is that for all of Massachusetts or for Reading? That's for Massachusetts. Okay. That's a, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a overall Massachusetts standard. We look at the um, dashboard um, through work and look at it that way. So always good to have contact. Any other questions for Carrie? Um, so just a, a quick update for everyone. Um, the uh, We're working diligently to support the Board of Health and get them the, the crew that they need. Um, the open position um, has been posted. The timing for that means that um, the VAST will be meeting before our September 22nd meeting. And then on the 22nd, the VAST will make a recommendation to the full board uh, in terms of how to proceed there to, to get them up to, to full capacity. Uh, Mark, if I, if I may just thank you again to the board for, for coming in um, during a unscheduled, for an unscheduled meeting to consider how best to approach filling that gap and appreciate that effort and support. Sure. And for the, the sake of the public, it's a little different than we discussed at our last meeting because now we've posted. So uh, new applicants can apply um, at, until what until what date? Uh, is it the end of this week? Do we know what the uh, the fifteen day posting would be? Yeah, fit the end of the posting would be the end of this week, but I'd have to check the posting to see if we actually put a cutoff date. We don't okay. always. Yeah, sure. yeah. Please, if you're interested, please apply anyway. But if you want it now, please do it soon. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Thank great. Okay, Bob. Let me pass it off to you, please. Thank you. A couple things. Um, command has also altered their meeting schedule to be the Monday before the Board of Health meets, and then obviously we can, can meet as needed also. Um, I put all the meeting notes in your packet this week. Um, you know, if you have interest, we'll certainly continue that. Um, usually the, the notes are done, uh, say, two, three days after the command meeting. Um, depending on whether that coincides with your packet that week or not, I may send them out by themselves in advance. Um, lastly, um, I was on a call with the state today and all the other cities and towns. And uh, Carrie, this is something that we discussed last Thursday at the Board of Health meeting briefly, so this will be a little bit of an update. Um, this is a Governor's Order COVID-19 number 49. So he's got 49 orders. Uh, August 28, 2020, supporting parents with children in remote learning. Um, so this is the uh, order that talks about having learning pods uh, for parents to be able to sort of share uh, children. And then specifically in Reading, there's an applicant for a much larger space uh, that's been in progress for a few weeks now. Um, today I learned that 
um, the applicant that's been in progress has to retroactively fit into the process that they've laid out. Unfortunately, the process has not been laid out in, in words yet. Uh, the state hoped to post some advice tonight. Um, they did share a uh, PowerPoint today that was helpful if I could have taken quick pictures, but I, I took good notes. Um, one thing I did today, um, the commissioner of um, early education and care said that the mayors and town managers should use their executive authority to appoint uh, what's called the municipal approving authority under that order. Um, when, when pressed uh, as to who that should be, uh, you know, school, school uh, committee, school department, um, police department, et cetera, she said the state was not offering any guidance or any advice, but that it could be a combination of entities. Um, where it's um, a cross-disciplinary approach, uh, today under that act and under that order, I appointed the uh, incident command team, uh, which consists of both chiefs, the superintendent and myself, and then uh, possibly a rotating member of the Board of Health to technically fill out that role. Um, once the state releases written guidance, town council can evaluate it and can determine if, if indeed I have the authority to do that. Um, and if not, the board may be asked to do this at your next meeting. Uh, the state asserted that I did, I'm not so sure. Uh, but in any event, we'll have it covered. It was important that I did something today, even if it has to be revised because the applicant is seeing uh, CPDC tomorrow night, um, has already extended offers to parents. So um, away we go as it is. Um, so I just wanted to update you that you may uh, see something uh, at your next meeting and it may be a little more involved, but I didn't want you to be surprised. And Carrie, there will be a lot more information forthcoming on that order. I know we talked about it at the Board of Health meeting on Thursday. So that's all. Thank you, Mark. Bob, has the applicant been made aware, presumably, of the new uh, EEC order? <laughs> you know, he had a meeting today that I had to step out of for this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know yet. But from the update I got from the meeting was that it went well and that he has a lot of work to do tomorrow for CPDC independent of this and that we'd tell him along the way. It's, it's not really a burden on the applicant. It's really a burden more on staff to follow certain procedures and file certain documents the state requires. It's really not any different for the applicant. Does it change the timeline for the applicant? It shouldn't matter, no. Vanessa, please. Thanks, Mark. Um, Bob, I heard you mention that, that um, the incident command group includes a member from the Board of Health. Is there a reason why there isn't a staff member um, handling that? I know the Board of Health has been um, dealing with a lot lately in, in the last couple months. Um, is there someone on staff that can provide that input or role and, and report back to the Board of Health to try and alleviate some of the burden on, on that crew? Well, this was a determination made last March and the board hasn't changed their opinion. What they have done is discuss whether they want to rotate membership. So I'll, I'll leave that up to a discussion that if they want to have it. Sure, thank you. Questions or comments? No, all set. Um, Carrie, thanks. I think you're dismissed. <laughs> oh, and just to say, Bob, I did appreciate um, the, the summaries of the command meetings. I found that helpful and would appreciate um, receiving them going forward. I, th I found them very informative. Okay, you bet. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Uh, next up, um, Laura, uh, town clerk elections update. I would first like to express my personal appreciation for um, handling a mammoth task so well. And, and getting everything done. There was a, a person who sent in a, a like a commendation for you uh, into the public comment, and it was great. It was really spot on. So uh, thank you for, for managing that. Well, thank you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start off with saying is that uh, we, we mailed out, um, let me get my exact numbers here. We mailed out 6,891 ballots for the recall and then 6,899 ballots for the primary. So that's uh, well over 12,000 ballots uh, 
um, over 13,000 ballots. And I have to say that without the help of the students from the National Honor Society, we never would have been able to pull that off. So I, I just want to, uh, at one point, we had students just coming in when they were available for time-wise, and they spent an hour or two. Um, we had volunteers that came in and spent the entire day for two weeks in a row, um, almost seven days a week for two weeks. And we had staff not taking days off to get through this. But I really want to thank the kids from the National Honor Society and, and all of the volunteers for the help that they did. Because um, again, we would not have been able to pull that off. So with that said, um, we also had about 2,400 ballots through, done through early voting um, during the week that we had early voting. And then we had um, just over about f just over 4,500 per election for uh, in person on election day. Um, as you probably know that the, this in throughout statewide, this has been the most the highest turnout primary in some time going all the way back the we had 1.5 million statewide and um, the highest we had prior to that was 1 million so for a state primary so um, I'm assuming that the mail-in ballot played a huge role in that um, and and um, the state is assuming that as well which is a good thing which also tells me it's going to stick around so once we get through November, we'll be working, the town clerks will be working with the state to come up with a little bit more of a automated process. So it's not so labor intensive. And with that said, um, I, I, you know, I, like I said, I wanna definitely thank the kids from the National Honor Society that did a, a lot of volunteer hours, um, but we're gonna be calling on them again because we're gonna be doing the same thing again in November. It's going to be a little bit easier. It'll be less chaotic because it'll be one election, one ballot. Um, but we'll be calling on them again to be able to get through that as well. Uh, usually, for a, a November uh, presidential election, we look between look at between eighty and ninety percent turnout. Um, we're probably going to end up very close to one hundred percent turnout. So that's um, twenty thousand registered voters that are going to be sent a ballot. Uh, so we'll definitely be calling on more help and more volunteers. Yes, Vanessa, you had a question? I do. Laura, I know that we as select board members are not allowed to participate in the local election. Can we volunteer our time for the presidential election? You can um, volunteer to help with before the election day, like the election, mailing out the ballots and that sort of thing, but you cannot work on election day. So, um, yeah, we'll be, definitely be needing some help with that, with mailing out ballots. Um, Thank you. Karen, so, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Karen was muted. <laughs> sorry, I had a question, Laura, when you finished. Go ahead. Okay, so I was wondering, um, so is the state going to be helping us out with some of the postal uh, expenses? We had to put out a lot of stamps on this time. And the wedding stamps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because I cleared the post office of every 70 cent stamp that they had. Um, so they, they did help out some with this one um, because the, the mail-in ballot law stated that the municipality would be putting on postage for the outgoing, but the um, state put on um, postage for the return. So they'll be doing the same thing again in November. They're paying for the return postage, but we have to do the outgoing. Um, and it just, it, we, we could have put the ballots through the machine instead of putting the stamps on, but the machine doesn't handle them as well, which means that we have to use the, the stickers. And you know we looked into the cost of the stickers and it would have cost us about $2,000 just for those stickers. So I'm like, let's just buy the stamps and and save that additional two thousand dollars. So that was the purpose behind the stamps. Did I also read in the Chronicle um, that you guys had some new technology debuting um, in the field house? I wasn't allowed in there, but um, I was reading about it. You weren't allowed in the field house? 
well, I mean, I tried not oh. to vote there since I wasn't voting. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, so we used, uh, if anybody had early voted, uh, in it, we've had early voting since 2016, as you know, um, and we've been using the poll pads during early voting since 2016. Um, and we use those at the field house instead of the voting list. Part of the reasoning for um, debuting them in September was to not have, uh, from a um, uh, perspective of, of safety for the, the election workers, they didn't have to flip through paper that everybody else was touching. They, cause the voting list was basically done away with and it was it, it basically an iPad. Um, and it, it speeds up the process of getting the voters through as well. That sounded like it was a good move. And it saved, it, um, for both elections, it saved about um, 48,000 sheets of paper. That's awesome. So one of the things that I wanted to mention, um, you know, uh, is that we are going to be making a few changes for November. There's some things that we kind of ran into um, during the September election. So I'll be talking with uh, command on making a few changes with the setup of the field house to make it go a little bit smoother than it did in September um, on the 1st. But uh, considering that we ha still had over 4,000 people show up at the field house, we need to just kind of make a, you know, keep it safe for everybody. And um, there are uh, quite a few people in Reading that believe that they still wanted to vote in person. But the other thing I'd like to get the word out about is that some of them came in and voted in person because they felt like that if they mailed their ballot back, that it wasn't gonna make it back on time. And there are some cases where that did happen, um, just a few, but uh, it will, for one, we'll have a better opportunity of start getting the ballots mailed out sooner in November in September, the system was not ready for us to start that process until two weeks before the election. We literally had two weeks to mail all those ballots out and come up with the process. Um, so we're now in a position where we can get started sooner. Um, but if if uh, a ballot, if they request a ballot, if the public requests a ballot by mail, then the, and they. Um, feel like that they want to, they can drop it in the town hall box for business versus mailing it back to be sure that we get it back. So that's something we just need to get out there. And um, we did have quite a few that did that, dropped it in the box instead of mailing it. But I just want to make sure that that's known that it, that way they don't have to worry about their ballot being returned. And, and Laura, do I understand correctly that you ended up emptying that box extremely regularly, especially in the uh, final few days? Yes, we uh, uh, the last week we emptied it um, three to four times a day. And the final weekend before the election itself, we emptied it um, five to six times um, on Saturday and Sunday. Great. So this is the silver box that's kind of as you're driving out of the town hall parking lot? Correct. On your left hand side. Yep. And we put a sign on there saying ballots, you know, put, put ballots here or drop ballots here so that you do, everybody is familiar with that's the box to put it in. Yeah. So just kind of help. I'm just asking to kind of help get the word out, you know, to drop the once the ballots start going out, um, we'll have the ballots more than likely uh, by the first week of October and we'll start mailing them out immediately. Um, like I said, we're in a, bit, a little bit better position than we were in September as far as that process. Both the ballot applications and the ballots themselves will be mailed out, could be mailed out as early as uh, early October. The, ba the ballot applications are going to go out from the um, secretary's office on September 15th. The ballots themselves will start getting mailed out as soon as we receive them. And usually we get them um, three to four weeks before the election. So I'm figuring we'll have them the first week of October at the very, at the very latest. So we'll start that process immediately. Laura, if, um, if people asked for a mail-in ballot for all elections when they received the last mailing from the Secretary of State, will we still be receiving another mailing from the Secretary? 
No. No, the secretary is only sending out those that haven't already requested. Um, let me just let me just clarify that they're sending out notices to anybody that was not in the system that they requested a ballot by September 1st. Um, as of September, uh, I'm sorry, as of August 31st, we had that anybody requested it, we had them in the system. So if anybody requested on September 1st or beyond, they're getting a notice because that didn't get into the system. Got it. So people who have requested a mail-in ballot should be um, receiving it in, in the early part of October by the, the first right. or yep. So October. Yep. Great, thanks. Sorry, Ann, I saw your hand. Um, uh, a few questions. Laura, are, do you feel, you've expressed you, you will need additional volunteers. Um, do we need to, could you use our assistance with recruiting more poll workers? Um, and do you need any more financial resources um, to effectuate the November election? So uh, I haven't pulled the exact numbers yet. My intent is to get the total number of what we've already spent for in September to Bob because we are going to go over expense. Um, we're going over expense because one of the postage, that's mm -hmm. something that was not calculated into the, the cost. Um, and then also, uh, we spent a little bit more on feeding the volunteers than we typically do because we had volunteers and staff that um, I want to say that I required, but I kind of encouraged them to work long hours without lunch breaks or, or dinner, and I kind of felt like I had to feed them. Um, so we spent a little bit more on that end than we typically do. So once I have the, the total figures, Bob will be receiving that in the next day or two. Um, but yes, we will need some more financial help. And as far as staffing, um, we had a lot of folks step up and volunteer. Um, I didn't end up using all of them for September, but I am gonna be using all of them for November. Um, it was one of the difficult things about this election is that typically in a typical election, we have, um, between eight to 16, in other words, one to two per precinct new staff. In this particular election, we ended up with one to two experienced people per precinct. So it made it kind of challenging. And I, and I have to say, um, it was a huge help. I ended up recruiting um, the uh, election. She was the election official in Lowell for years, she now works for the city of Lynn. I recruited her to come down and help me with some of the troubleshooting because of the fact that we had so many new people. I'm not so sure we would have made it through the day without her. Um, so that was a huge help. And you know, she said she may help out again in November. Um, so yeah, we're probably gonna need some more help. We'll see, cause I'm gonna need more people in November because the ballot count is, even though we had two elections, the ballot count's gonna be higher. Even though the ballot count's gonna be higher, it's gonna be much simpler because it's only gonna be one ballot um, and there's less room for error. You know, I have to say that there was some, some issues with some folks getting the wrong ballot because of the fact that we had five ballots to deal with and we had so many different volunteers. But every um, issue that I was made aware of was fixed. You know, so that we'll have less of that for November because it's only one ballot. But uh, and I want to also um, mention that um, it, it it was a huge help with, with and to make the election more successful in the fact that all of the residents um, were very patient with some of the issues that we had, and you know, and it was very helpful to, to for them to reach out to us and let us know what was going on and be patient while we fix the problems. Um, I'm still finding a few issues here and there, but again, you know, we're working them out. So patience was um, a huge help with, with the residents. Bob, from a budget standpoint, um, is the, will the additional resources need to come from FinCom reserves or is there, do we have the resources we need um, at the ready? I'm guessing that we'll probably ask for a budget transfer at November town meeting. Okay. or possibly April town meeting if we can wait that long. Okay. I don't think it's urgent though. Okay. Um, I did notice in the 
one of one of the sets of command minutes that there was um, some kind of prioritization for out of state ballots. I did I did um, hear from one resident um, who was concerned their their college student child um, had not received their ballot until you know the Friday before the election, and then they'd spent you know money to fast track it to get to get back to Reading. Um, is that something um, you think would will be able to be avoided for uh, for November, given the extra time um, or, or a, a change in process? So part of part of the issue with the September is that we uh, there's several issues that played into role there. One of the issues is having two elections on the same day, but the other the main issue was the fact that we had such a short time frame to be able to get this into place. And we literally had, you know, the um, buckets, the mail buckets, the post office uses, we literally had three of those buckets full of those cards come in. We had, we didn't have time to go through and we had to manually put them into the system and then manually mail out the ballot and manually put it into the system that the ballot had been mailed. So in, you know, with the limited resources and, and the trying to get things into place because of the pandemic, we could not go through and send out uh, to those that are out of state first. With November, because of, because of the fact that all of those cards have already been processed, mm -hmm. um, anybody that requested for the September to be mailed out is already in the system. Therefore, they'll be the first ones to go out. So yes, November is going to be much better um, and the, you know, a little bit more organized in the process to be able to get the out-of-state ones out, providing that they've already requested it. If they haven't, then that's something that we need to make sure that we tell them, the residents, make sure that anybody that has a ballot that's being mailed out of state to be to request that now. Um, mm -hmm. So that way we can put them into the system ahead of time and get and those would be the first ones to go out. For November, do ballots need to be received by 8pm on election day or do they just need to be postmarked by that day? They need to be postmarked. Okay. Um, and then there's a five, I believe it's a, it's either a three or a five day delay. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a five day delay once, as long as it's been postmarked by, um, 8 PM on November 3rd. Okay. So, Very good. Vanessa. Thanks, Mark. Um, Bob, I, I understand Laura needed a lot of volunteers, um, for this election, especially for the, for the ballot, um, envelope stuffing. Is there a way that we can redirect administrative resources for November sort of planning ahead that, you know, we know it's coming. Um, are there staff that can sort of help this effort as well? Relying on volunteers is always a little um, unpredictable. Yeah, I'll, I'll say there's, there's, this, there's a clear distinction in the two sets of responsibilities. Uh, that Laura just kind of mentioned in passing. One is before the election, and anyone can do that, I'll say. Um, but during the election day itself, uh, for one thing, anyone that works in the schools have to be quarried. So there's a pretty hard line between the types of volunteers or the types of poll workers. Um, we did, I mean, town hall was, was like a uh, beehive for about two weeks. And I have to say, I was really impressed that all the kids and um, all the adults that I saw, except for one, were wearing masks. And were, despite the crowd and the activity, it was really well done from a social distancing standpoint. So Laura, I don't know if you could physically use more people than you had at the peak. Um, there was plenty of staff working, but I'm happy to certainly offer you more. Um, you know, we have staff that was not in the building that, for instance, could help you. Um, so I'm sure we'll discuss this uh, internally. We usually have a post post mortem kind of meeting. We just haven't had that yet, and uh, direct whatever resources she needs. The, the trickier part will be on election day, um, where there are, you know, more firm rules about who can and can't work uh, that day. Uh, but Laura is good about letting me know what she needs. Great, thank you, Bob. 
Any other questions or comments for Laura? Carol. Oh, sorry, Hank, thanks. Uh, Laura, so I, I voted in person and I, I wanna thank all the volunteers and the town staff. I think everyone did a great job. I'm sure you probably think it could have went better, um, but from my perspective, it was, it was pretty good. I like seeing the uh, iPads, uh, less papers, and I look forward to November. And I uh, just want to thank everybody for all the hard work they did those two weeks and beyond. Thank you. Well, I have to say it was definitely not the most organized election I've run, and um, it's been over 30 of them. But it's also, you know, it, it um, anybody that's been through my election training, they'll tell you that I, my number one rule is to keep the town of Reading and my name out of the paper in a negative manner. Um, <laughs> And uh, we were successful in that, you know, so to me, that's, that's a good thing, you know, um, but November will definitely be a little bit more organized. Great. Oh, and you're, you're on mute. I was just saying, thank you so much for all your work, Laura. I am truly above and beyond into all of the volunteers and staff. Incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. It, it takes a team, the, um, between the town clerk staff, and all of the volunteers and the uh, kids from the National Honor Society and all of the election staff, it just, uh, yeah, I, it, it's a lot of work, but it's, a, they have a good time too. And I so- be able to take a, uh, to get some well-earned well rest. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking next election. week off. Yeah. Good, excellent. So if people are, are so excited by what they've heard this evening and they wanna reach out to you and volunteer, I assume the best way is either to to call the clerk's office or to send you an email at I assume town clerk at ci.reading.ma.us. Yes, email is best because um, I I if I have it in in the, the email then I you're guaranteed I'm going to get back to you. Sometimes the voicemail gets lost. Great, thanks, Laura. Thank you for the time. Um, you guys have a great night. You as well. Um, so it's about 7.39. Um, Bob, I was thinking liaison reports may be pretty quick. Should we just try and buzz through that or do you think we should go to the, the hearing? And, and Caitlin, do we have people, are they all waiting in the waiting room now? Uh, yes, they are. Um, all right, tell you what, let's do the hearing so we can keep those folks close to one time. Let's do that first and then we'll come back to the liaison reports. Um, so Carlo, I have and I will project, but it's pretty small. <laughs> Probably should just email this to you. It might be better. Oh, I think it's readable. You can let me know. Hang on, I'll put it up on the screen right now. Are you able to see that or is that too small? Oh, you're on mute. A little bigger would be helpful. Uh, hang on one second. Let me see if I can make that. Is it in the packet? Uh, no. No, it's so, not. Yeah. Um, I, that's the biggest I can make it. Um, All right, I got, I got it, I got it. Great, thanks. I'll do my best. All right, legal notice, Town of Reading, to the inhabitants of the Town of Reading. Please take notice that the select board of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on September 8th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. remotely on Zoom to act as an alteration of premises request to an annual all alcohol package license uh, Actually, excuse me for one sec, Carl, were you doing that? Um, Caitlin, are you letting those folks in as we're speaking? Great, thanks. Sorry, Carl. All, pack of, all, alcohol, all alcohol package license. Can't read that word. Package store license. Package store uh, license for Jay and Ricky, Inc., DBA, Ricky's Liquors on 214 uh, uh, Main Street, Reading, Mass. A copy of the proposed Documents regarding this topic will be in the select board packet on the website, um, www.reading.ma.gov. All interested <laughs> parties are restricted to attend the hearing and may submit their comments to the meeting by email prior to 4.30 p.m. on September 8th, 2020 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us per Bob Lusher, town manager. Thanks, Carlo. Sorry that that was so 
Okay, great. So I see, uh, I see, uh, well, it, it says Ricky on, on your screen. Welcome to the meeting. But I see two of you. So one of you, I'm guessing, is Ricky and the other is not. Yep, I'm Ricky. I'm the <laughs> younger son of Kalpish Patel. And he's, that's my dad right there. Hi. Nice to meet you folks. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having us and taking the time. Oh, sure. Um, so in terms of activity, um, maybe I, I can kick things off. If I understand correctly, the request is to essentially um, not have the market operating anymore, instead expand the size of the package store to encompass both the existing package store and the market. That is correct, yes. Great. Um, and I know uh, in our packet, there's some information a little bit from the past and, and some of the questions that were brought up by some previous boards. Um, one of the questions that I had is in terms of access to the store by miners, what, um, where it was a market, I know you had miners that were coming in before. Is it your intention only to have um, liquor in the store? Or are there gonna be other items as well? And, and do you have a policy in mind for miners? Uh, JK's market will, uh, unfortunately, after 25 years, be out of business. And so we'll close those doors and it'll just be the liquor store only. Okay. And, and will you, what's your policy with miners? How, how is that? Uh, are there, the there same way we enforce it with liquor stores. Like no one can come in under 21. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and you post that and obviously. Yeah, that's up on the liquor store already. And that's how we'll continue to run that side to, as well. I mean, it would be one store. We'll take down the middle dividing wall, which we put up like about seven years ago when we created Ricky's Liquors. And so we'll just remove that wall and then make the whole property or the premise a liquor store. Got it. So there won't be any obstruction, uh, essentially. You're going to take that wall out completely, it sounds like. Right. That's correct. That wall is already a temporary wall that we put in ourselves. So it's not like part of the permanent structure of the building. Got it. Great. Yeah. Board members, questions? Karen. Question. Um, I, I saw the previous board had questions about um, rear and front doors and just the liquor part. And I saw we were taking the wall out. And it looks like now you'll have two, um, two egresses allow people to come in from the parking lot and one egress. Are you going to, in terms of managing who's going in and out of your store, are you going to plan to keep both of those egresses in the front or close one? Uh, we plan on closing the JK's market side and just having the Ricky's liquor side open. Most likely what we'll do is put like just shelves in front of it or something, just like cover that entrance. So that way it doesn't, you know, people don't try to enter from that side. Okay. Yeah, so there... we'll just put like a yeah, products and stuff in front of there. Okay, this isn't my area of expertise. Do we have any um, regulations that you know sort of say for this kind of a store you can only have one <clears throat> one entrance to to make sure that people aren't sneaking in and out, miners? That would be something when we do the construction work with the contractor. Hopefully, they'll find out, and we'll try to find out when we get the town permits. Especially with like how many entrances and exits we can have. But yeah, I'm not, I will find out. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, hey, just to be, uh, just to be any, clear, uh, tonight is only the alcohol license, the liquor license. Um, you know, the building department still has to review their plans, the fire department and so on. Right, yeah. Thank you, appreciate that. Other questions or comments? And, and you're muted. I saw in the packet a, a past uh, or at least past allegation of a violation. Um, and I was wondering um, what steps you've taken since I think it was 2014 um, to ensure that um, minors aren't being sold to. And um, wanted to make sure you're aware that the bull, that the select board updated our, our liquor licensing policy in the last year um, and that you're aware of changes that were made there with respect to um, the records that, um, that that need to be sent to the town um, and with what frequency around tips training? I believe it's annual, right, the tips training? And all our cashiers are tips certified as well. And the incident that you're referring to in 2014, that cashier was immediately fired. And we I don't think we've had any, any compliance issues after that. All right. 
Excellent. So we've passed all our compliance checks since then. Thank you. Other questions? A quick point of clarifications. Um, when we um, discussed the liquor store over on Walker's Brook Drive, I believe where they were expanding their business, they came in and everything was designed. Bob, this is a question for you. Is this the same process the folks on Walker's Brook Drive went through or is this a different order of business where I had the impression they came in, everything was designed and approved and we were the final step. And this, uh, as you pointed out, is an earlier step. Um, that's a good question. I, I've seen it done both ways, so I don't think there's a right and a wrong. Um, it is fundamentally different just to expand the store, though, than to open a whole new one. So it might be that the whole new one uh, it makes more sense to wait for the liquor license to the end. So I, I don't think there's any uh, any importance to the order they're going in. Um, you know, if they had concerns about the building part of it, they probably would have done that first. But it's probably just a formality in terms of how to construct, not not can we construct. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and just to uh, clarify, the store was one store before. JK's market was on both sides, and yep. then we divided it. So we don't think there should be any issues nope. making it into one store once again. I, my fellow board members can correct me if I'm misremembering, but some of our new policy around around liquor, our liquor licenses, um, and with respect to tips training, is it's I think. If you have new employees coming on, you need to provide information with respect to tips training. Um, with great, it, you can't just wait until the next year to do so. People need to anyone who's working in the store needs to be tips tips certified. There's not a grace period um, to to get them on board, and they have to they need to be um, trained when they come on. Um, and my fellow prior board, to yeah, yeah prior, exactly, prior to yeah. So that's, I think that's new. Um, so just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. Yeah. And for our expansion, we don't like have any necessary like new employment that we need because in fact, we'll probably reduce some payroll because we're getting rid of the one store. So now we only need like one cashier. So yeah, everyone who's working there from day one will be tip certified. Great. Excellent. You, you're probably detecting from this board um, a lot of interest and concern. Um, specifically as it relates to not serving minors. Understandable. <laughs> Very understandable. Making sure that we, we did go through, as Ann mentioned, um, a lot of discussion and change the policies, but it's this board's very strong feeling that that's paramount in what's going on here. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, and we, we ask that you, we do more than ask, we require that you are extremely compliant. <laughs> yep. And we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page, that, that you folks understand it as we do, that this is a very high priority for this community. Yep, and we try our best to, you know, uphold that. Great. Any other questions, comments? No, okay, let me, I think I've got a motion. Just one second to find it. This one is gonna be much larger. Carla, can I ask you to read the first one here, please? Yes. Uh, we can make it approve and not deny, I guess. Okay. Move that the board approve the alteration of premises application for an annual all alcohol package store license for Ricky's Liquor at 214 Main Street, Reading, Mass. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vanessa. Any further discussion by the board? Not appearing. I'm going to call out as I, I see you on my screen. Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark? Yes. So we are 5-0. Thank you folks very much. We, uh, we wish you uh, very good luck and um, yeah, appreciate your, your being a, a business here in Reading. Hopefully we'll have 25 more years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you folks. Yep. Best of luck. Okay, let's come back to talk about liaison reports. Um, Carlo, can I start with you? Any any reports to, to mention? Yeah, thank you. Um, so since 
I don't know, several weeks ago, I guess. So the on the historic commission, the last meeting, they were uh, attempting to get into the library, into their archives, to look for some photos because um, they're going to wrap the utility boxes. Uh, those aren't going to be painted unless something is, is going to change. Um, as many have seen in town, um, we have a lot of great new colorful utility boxes in town and some are reserved for the um, historic commission. So um, hopefully they got in by now and, and they wanted to gather some photos um, so those can be superimposed, uh, uh, wrapped uh, on utility boxes. And CPDC, uh, the last meeting and the meeting again tomorrow night, I don't know the full agenda, but the last meeting uh, was primarily uh, geared towards the uh, Chronicle building on Main Street on the sides and scope of it. And uh, they went over the plans and how many units and the, um, the fancy new parking system underground, that lift system, uh, city lift system. So CPDC asked them to come back and to see if they could reduce the footprint or reduce the size of the building. They were very concerned of the way it's gonna sit on Main Street. And the Recreation Committee um, discussed um, allowing some members of the Rec Committee through the pickleball community to have uh, temporary lights installed at Memorial Park. And I believe that will eventually come before us. Uh, they'd like to extend their season uh, and play uh, at Memorial Park, which is already lined for pickleball. And so they're going to propose that at the recreation meeting this week, rec committee meeting this week. And I believe unless something changes, it's going to come before us uh, to vote to approve the temporary lights that will be locked up um, and given a code. And uh, unless I guess something else changes, uh, those lights will be welcome to the tennis community as well on behalf of the pickleball community because we'll have to raise some funds uh, to pay for the lights. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Carol. Ann. Oops, still on mute. Uh, Josh Goldlust, the chair of ATRAC, asked me to convey that ATRAC is uh, planning a Zoom listening event with Senator Lewis, Representative Haggerty, and Re Representative Jones, um, hopefully for some time in September. Um, Carlo, feel free to share um, and and uh, contribute anything additional um, to what, what I'm about to say, but the ad hoc committee um, has continued to meet and will be meeting as soon as next week, although we have a little bit of scheduling confusion to iron out um, jointly with the Library Board of Trustees. Um, I think the last update we had provided to the select board was that um, when I had brought the proposal of the ad hoc committee to the Library Board of Trustees, they had asked us to go back to the ad hoc committee to flesh out the proposal and to respond to questions that they raised as well as questions that residents had raised. So the ad hoc committee has been meeting over a, a, a set of meetings since June um, to fine tune the proposal um, and to come up with a set of frequently asked questions um, that are responsive to both the Board of Library Trustees questions and resident concerns. Um, so we've we've worked on that and are, are preparing to go to, back to the Library Board of Trustees with that proposal. Um, what I think has been really helpful, at least for me, is we've been um, bringing Amy Lannon, our library director, in on the conversation and she attended our last ad hoc committee meeting um, to provide feedback. Um, it, the several um, members and advisors of the committee have also worked on developing a draft um, job description for the director position that is envisioned under the proposal. Um, Carrie Perry, um, uh, Pat Callie, and Andrew Grimes drafted um, a draft job description. Now that would not be something final that would go before the library board. We would we would present that to them, but um, assuming they take on our uh, the ad hoc committee's proposal as their own, um, that that job description would have to go um, and be developed further by library staff in conjunction with human resources. But it's a starting point for them. 
Uh, Carlo, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add. Um, Carlo's been a, a great partner, as has Bob, um, in bringing um, this proposal forward and, and fine tuning it. And I appreciate uh, both of your efforts in this regard. No, thanks, Ann. I think that was well said. Uh, the meetings were pretty productive, and uh, the, the attendees and the, the volunteers and the ad hoc committee, I think, have been uh, well represented. And, uh, and it should go forward and Amy will you know, kind of uh, intends to make it part of the strategic plan uh, for the library. So that will, that will take up some more time that was maybe anticipated. Um, so it'll be a good presentation to the town meeting. And I think uh, so far it's going well. Thanks. Oh, and that, rem that reminds me, um, thank you, Carlo, that I think the last time we discussed this with, with the select board, we were envisioning um, it coming before November town meeting for a vote, a vote as um, an adjustment to this year's budget. Now we're envisioning based on um, the realities of bu both budgeting uh, and the library strategic plan that it makes sense to bring it before April town meeting as part of the library's budget. Um, and that's based on guidance that um, Bob and Amy have provided. Thank you. That's it. Great. Okay, Karen. Oh, hi, quick update. Um, so I also attended the CBDC discussion um, regarding the new building at 513 Main. And then subsequent to that meeting, the developer reached out to me. I had mentioned that we were spending a lot of our meetings talking about, you know, green communities, what we can do to green up Reading. Um, and um, so we were able to set up a meeting with, uh, reached out to John Sempeck on the RMLD Board of Commissioners and he reached out to Colleen and she and Chuck Underhill were able to get on a Zoom call with myself and the developer to talk about, as Carlo mentioned, they're talking about some pretty innovative technology, the city lift. Um, and they were very interested to hear about alternatives to natural gas in the building, demand for that, how to incorporate electronic uh, EV vehicles. Um, so City Lift has some EV options. They're quite cost prohibitive. And it was a great meeting. Colleen and Chuck were um, very willing to work with the developer to help them move their concept forward. It's it's at this point, it's all on paper. And so there, he mentioned, the developer mentioned there were some factors with the, the gas configuration at that site, that this actually might be an excellent building to talk about more um, electrification. And um, it is going to be smaller than the stretch code commercial limits that we'll, that we've been looking at. So it wouldn't necessarily fall under stretch code, but you know, given what he's got to get done, he's very, I, I was very excited to hear that he's willing and open to newer technologies and electrification and, and doing what he can to help Reading um, achieve our goals um, of being greener. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Vanessa? Um, I have a general question, less of a report. Uh, are we going to discuss uh, this evening the cell tower? Um, we've obviously received quite a number of messages from residents. I've spoken to some of them. Um, are we going to discuss that at a later time today, tonight, Mark? Um, we need to. Um, and yeah, I think that um, I kind of jumped over it in my my early thoughts. Um, why don't we, if we could, let's finish liaison reports. Let's go to public comment and then we can come back. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. A um, couple of reports from, from my side. Um, I attended the audit committee meetings. I think I already talked about the RMLD. I went to the town audit uh, as well. Um, as usual, Sharon and staff did a great job. Um, all the materials are there. Um, it looks good. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to the auditors about best practices and, and making sure that um, we kind of poke at an area each year where there could be some areas that are unclear, sometimes where cash balances uh, accumulate, things like that. Anyway, they're, they're, they're working on that activity. Um, we asked them to think a lot about, to give us advice where they can related to COVID reimbursements. They obviously can't guide us as to what we should do, but they can 
uh, help us in, when we have questions about, hey, did, does this one uh, comply? So um, good audit um, and finished and the, the committee met for that. Um, I was at with the trust fund commissioners also, they're doing some really good things supporting elderly residents with some of the, the hospital funds. Um, they have been given permission to, to do some things. They're helping with some medical appointments. Um, while we haven't had the van available, um, they've worked on a structure to get uh, elderly resident, as residents into a cab uh, for some medical appointments. Hopefully the van will be able to, to come back, but we'll see. Um, but I was very impressed with kind of how they go through it and what they're doing and, and um, kind of how they, they uh, use the fund. So, so uh, kudos to Endry for that. Um, the other activity, and, and here's where I'll bring it in, Vanessa, if it's all right, is I held an office hour on Friday. Um, which was great. It was the all-time highest turnout I've ever had for an office hour. I had 14 people attend a wow. Zoom call. Mostly came in um, by video, um, but a few came in just by phone. Um, and I think it worked well. I think everyone that wanted to speak was able to speak. The vast majority focused on the cell tower uh, discussion um, and kind of where things are. And asking, there are some specific questions they asked, which I will, I'll send um, a memo, Bob, to you with some of the questions they asked there um, beyond some of the things that I've seen in the notes so far. Um, but they're obviously very interested in, in, in the situation and in the board taking a look at that. Um, we talked a little bit about when would be an opportunity to have a public discussion um, after staff has had some time to kind of look further into the issue and see what some of the options are. So staff is, is planning to, to do that. And then we talked about um, our October 20th meeting as an opportunity to have a public meeting aspect to it also. And I think we would probably want to anticipate many residents uh, that would like to speak at that meeting. Um, and, and the thought here was that if we have some staff feedback first, that can be uh, more helpful to the process in terms of what some possible steps are from there, as opposed to, um, getting more input in advance of looking at what some of the options are. So my, my thought would be to put that onto the agenda of October 20. So if that, no problems, if folks don't have an issue with that, that's my suggestion in terms of going forward. And that will be um, very publicly noticed, um, including for, we're developing a list obviously of folks that are, are interested, not just the butters, but others that are interested as well. Mark? Carl. I have a question or maybe a comment uh, for all the neighbors because we did receive quite a few emails uh, with their concerns, which are, uh, you know, I would be concerned as well uh, if I was in that neighborhood. But is there any way to ask the neighborhood to maybe have a representative? Because if we have 30 people saying the same exact thing, it might be helpful if they can gather each other's emails because they all, you know, every email, a lot of it was a copy and paste email sharing the same concerns. Uh, some were brief, some were extensive, some included data on the frequencies and, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I read them all and responded to them all. And, and I feel some calls, I'm sure other board members did as well. But I think it'd be very helpful if we had uh, maybe no more than two representatives, if there's two different aspects they want to cover to speak on behalf of either a street or the entire neighborhood. I think that would be helpful for the board, but that's just my opinion. Um, if the board would like, I'd be happy to reach out um, to, to some of the folks that I, I spoke with. Um, they have requested that if board members would like to um, take a look and, and visit with, with some of the residents, socially distanced, of course, that they would um, very much like for that to happen. Um, but I, I would did be that to earlier today, and it was I, it was worthwhile. I thought. Great, great. Um, if the board would like, I'm happy to to reach out and and ask um, if they might organize uh, into a, a smaller than than 30 people uh, that would like to speak. We could certainly encourage that, but I think we allow anyone to speak who who wants to. That sounds exactly right. Yeah, Mark, this what... Oh, sorry, Vanessa. I, I wasn't trying to discourage anyone by any means. Right. I, yeah. I think uh, uh, if we all read the emails, they were pretty, uh, pretty much the same. Yeah, so I, I will say that um, 
in the in the 14 people I spoke with, you know, most of them were about the cell tower. They did bring up some very specific questions that I think are are, are going to be helpful for the staff to, to be able to look at. Uh, you know, questions like, you know, why do we have a fire tower? Excuse me, why do we have a, a water tower? I, I kind of put the two together. But you know, you know, it would be good just to be able to answer for everyone so they understand what's going on and why, and the process that already um, has taken place, and what options there are. Mark, I will say to just to echo Carlo, um, that ha had been my idea as well, to have a representative from the neighborhood or two. This has gone over very well with other neighborhoods when they are facing issues. Um, I would also encourage them to, if you're watching, hello, um, thank you for the email. I, I would encourage you to um, make a list of the top three or five or, or 10 concerns, whatever, whatever the neighborhood has um, that you'd like the town to be aware of um, and the board to be aware of um, so that we can help address and mitigate what those might be. Um, and also so that the staff can come prepared or, uh, or to answer those types of questions. So of course, everyone is welcome to talk to us individually, uh, but this does certainly help with the organization and with the town's ability to respond to your concerns. Great. I, I would just say kind of in, in closing on this topic, on the office hour topic, um, I thought it was great. I mean, it was really good. And it was a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, it, the, the format seemed to work very well to me. So I, I would encourage other board members to let's schedule times to, to do it going forward. I did one during the day. Um, you know, I'm sure we can, you know, we used to do it just before meetings at night. I think, you know, different options are great. Um, and again, Zoom and telephone work great. So cool. Um, okay, so that's it on liaison. Let's go to public comment. So I know- Bob had a comment, Mark. Oh. Bob had a comment. All right, thank you. Bob, you're on mute, though. Thank you. If I might just share my screen, I just have two quick things under the town manager's uh, report. Oh, sorry. My apologies. No, not at all. Um, hopefully, you can see the town's website. Um, one is a micro, uh, micro enterprise business grant, and thank you to one of the members that's already shared this on social media. Um, Reading has $210,000 of grant funds available to micro businesses. Uh, the deadline is late September, so this is something that the small businesses uh, should get to. Um, you know, this is a potentially tremendous boost for a small business, you know, a three or four person business uh, to get a grant as much as $10,000. So I'd encourage folks to look this over and uh, congratulate uh, Aaron and staff just being one of the 23 municipalities that, that got this. Um, second thing and, and part of a uh, big part of your agenda next uh, meeting, um, this is the downtown parking information sessions. The board knows about them, but just so the public knows. Um, again, it's on the website. There's a list of detailed. These are the remaining future ones starting on the 15th. Um, lots of public information sessions um, when Julie uh, is, uh, you know, in front of you in two weeks, she'll certainly describe some of the things she's heard and learned. And um, in my uh, cover memo for this week, you've already seen some of the changes we've made based on these meetings. So the turnout has been really quite good uh, under the circumstances um, and the feedback's been very helpful for staff. So that's all I have, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Just to uh, reiterate two things there, one on the, um, the parking, we have a public hearing at our next meeting that's um, that's publicly posted. And so um, in addition to the opportunities to speak directly with Julie and to interact with those groups, there will be a public hearing as well. Um, and second, on the micro grants, um, kudos again to Aaron, that's great. The process for businesses, number one is, I guess they should look at the website, see if they might be um, able to apply. And if they have any questions, they can reach out to Aaron. Is that kind of the best approach? Yeah, there's two contacts listed on the website. Aaron is one and the state is another. So either one. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to public comment. Um, so is is uh, Ralph the, the only person? Great. Yes, and he's here. I see uh, Denise McCarthy is there. I'm not sure if she's there for public comment. And David Zeke is presumably for the climate. Denise, Denise is for climate too. He is, okay. Great. I'll let Ralph in.
Hello, Ralph. We can hear you and we see what says Ralph's iPad. Well, I'm here. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Please, we're all ears. The last uh, meeting we had, you people were um, going to do some additional investigation um, behind the scenes, whatever you were going to be doing, and the report back on told me to come back on this particular meeting. Um, I can just give you an update that Monday and Tuesday this week, um, Maya tree did so, and we removed the trees um, that were in question. Um, and um, we were surprised also to see a couple of these things, even way up at the very, very top of these things were, were a significant issue on it. So I'm just waiting. I, I've given you all the information I have. Um, I basically just going back over to the obvious report that Mike Hannafin, the town manager, you know, town um, tree warden gave out. And the five trees that you people were talking about all five of those trees, Mike rated a four out of five as being dangerous. Um, the three deciduous trees, he rated number twos on this thing, which we wound up trimming. But the other five that were monstrous pine, and I think you were uh, you were out and you saw what we were looking at, were all rated a four out of a five, sir. And th that's that's not a one and two. That's not a healthy tree. That's an issue. And you saw the one that uprooted, and that's that's basically what I was doing. I was trying to protect not only my property, but also the well-being of the people who inhabit the particular home. So, so I'm just wondering what the town is is decided to do on this. I'm still looking for restitution to help me out with this particular bill. They were dangerous trees in the town. They're on town property. Even the conservation committee gave permission to remove them and the conservation would never give permission to remove any healthy trees whatsoever. Um, so I'm just, I'm looking for, I'm looking for some help, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ralph. Um, I don't know that we have specific feedback for you um, at this point, um, other than there is not a policy in place to address uh, trees on public land that abut to private property. Um, and I think that there probably is something we should explore and, and uh, ask staff to come back with recommendations on. It, how do other members feel? Was that not the direction you were going to be doing on the last particular meeting, sir? Um, it was to see if there was any history um, of having done this, and I'm not aware that there is. Um, and there is not, a, I don't believe that there is a policy related to this that exists. And I think what, what the board needs to do is decide if we want to create such a policy, ask staff to create such a policy, if that makes sense, what's the right thing to do. But we, you know, we, we can't just kind of kick the can down the road. We, we should make a decision on how to handle this. Again, I know this is unprecedented area, you know, territory to be perfectly honest with you. And, um, you know, again, I wouldn't even be pursuing this thing if it was on my property, that's a mood issue, but they were trees. Uh, you saw them, a couple other people have saw them. And if there's not a significant policy in place to, to address that type of things, where does one go as a taxpayer in the town here, sir? Yeah, I, I know that there was some accommodation that was offered um, and that that that's not what the direction you wanted to to go so i think that we need to either decide that there should be a policy on this or that it's something that we we really can't address um i think we also wanted to get a little feedback from town council i'm not sure that we were able to, to town council specific to does the select board have jurisdiction here did you get that information from council I'm not aware that that was an issue. I certainly can bring it to town council. I, I know there was a question as to what's conservation's jurisdiction, perhaps versus the select board. I can certainly ask. Got it. Yeah, I think th this could represent a substantial issue um, because we have plenty of property that abuts to uh, public land. And um, we probably need to come up with some, some standard policy for, for what we're going to do about it. 
so I don't think we can give you a direct answer here, Ralph. I think we need to kind of figure out how to proceed, get some answers, and then decide how to proceed, um, asking staff for suggestions on how to handle something like this. Yeah, I think we need to, would need to add this to a future agenda. Right. So let's let's plan to do that. Let's put it on a future agenda uh, for to have a specific discussion. We'll take specific action uh, for next step. So, Ralph, sorry, it's not something we can resolve uh, here and now for you. But what we can do is is get it onto an agenda um, with specific action to take place from there. An agenda being what between now and the next meeting, or it's just open ended, sir. Uh, so we need to put it on, on an agenda. I just can't promise you uh, which agenda yet, um, but soon. Um, I, I, I know that next meeting is going to be quite full, so my uh, expectation would be October. Wow. Now, you've mentioned you've gone to council on this. I have not gone but, to out. Ralph, I'm, I'm going to cut you off there. We, we allow for kind of two minutes. Usually, we're, we don't engage um, back and forth other than an agenda item. Okay. Um, but we have here, I think that we, we need to address it more formally. So, and I, I don't mean legal by formal, but formal meaning put it onto our agenda and discuss it. So where do I stand from here? What, what follow up or what do I do? Do I just wait and so you folks let me know what's going on or invite me to another meeting or what, sir? Karen, you have a comment? Just a point of clarification. I thought we already had an agenda item for this particular item. So I don't, I, certainly we are very busy, so we can't keep talking about the same stuff over again, but we can probably figure it offline. But I, I just point of clarification, I thought we already had this as a specific agenda item. Yeah, so we, we did it the last meeting. Okay, um, I'm not, all right, I remember correctly. Oh, we, didn't we, didn't it. we didn't close it. So. Yeah, before, if someone could just get back to me off, off after this is done and just let me know what's gonna be happening. I'll definitely bow out of this, let you people take care of what else you're doing. Fair enough. We'll do that. Okay. Thanks, Ralph. For your time, everyone. I appreciate it. Please, everyone, be safe. I don't know how to get out of this particular meeting, Chairman, so I'm going to shut off my computer. <laughs> oh, I think Caitlin can, can yeah. escort you off gently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next on our agenda, sustainability and master plan. So could we, let's invite in um, David and Denise. Oh. Hi, Denise. Evening. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Oh, sorry, you moved into a different position. There you go. Ah. <laughs> Welcome. How are you? Sorry, we're you? It's behind. Good. Good. David's in here yet? No. David is here. I am here. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I found it very enlightening in terms of some of the activities, but um, probably would make sense. Please, you know, some highlights in terms of the plan, where you're headed. And as you know, we have the stretch code uh, uh, as a an item that's next on our discussion for this evening. So let me hand it over to you folks. Do you have the presentation or do you want me to run it or what? Um, we all have it. Are, are there slides that you want to pull from there? Uh, well, I'm just gonna, if I can share my screen, let me just, I can show them that way. Do you want me to do that? Please. Can I, can I do that? Uh, yes. Hang on. Um, Make sure in the right spot here. Um, David, I can share the screen if you prefer quite easily. No, I got that. Thanks. I, but I, I just was not in the right place here. I think. How's that? Um, if you can make it as big as you possibly can, that will be appreciated. Mm hmm. That's as big as I possibly can. Is that working? Good for me. Okay. We get that logo on the website. I love that. Who did that logo? Look at the date on that logo, 2006. Us did that, right? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> so 
So uh, the one I want to talk to you about was, was the sustainability plan that the Climate Advisory Committee has been working on. And uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes just talking about how we got to it and then some of the highlights of it and how it fits. Um, I won't go through the committee again. Let me just go through this. Uh, the, the membership has not changed since I talked to you um, the last time. So it, I wanted to point out that there are uh, a number of plans that the Climate Advisory Committee has participated in or generated dating back several years. And these were among the starting points for us. Um, this, this exercise that we, that we did this time around was, was a very much a bottoms up exercise where we looked at dozens, if not hundreds of, of, uh, of, very, of specific tasks, uh, ideas, recommendations, and many of them were pulled from, from some of these plans. Um, the problem that we had with these plans was that because they were very specific plans with, with actions and due dates and so forth, they were all well ac accepted, but, but many of the actions, most of the actions were never, never even started, uh, let alone accomplished. So what we wanted to do was to, was to take this uh, and, and to, to push it up a level. So what you're gonna see is some, is some summaries of, of, of information. So I'm gonna talk to you about buildings, transportation, food and health. Um, these were just these are just categories that that we um, that we collected information into. So we started we did analysis of all these low level items, uh, looked at the costs and the benefits of doing uh, each one, but then summarized it into some high level goals. So what we want to see happen is that Reading adopt some high level sustainability goals um, that can be incorporated into our master plan. Uh, and that guide decisions as we make them. So even things that we, without without um, getting very specific in the beginning, if we lay out some 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 general goals, uh, we want to include goals even if we are not going to pursue them actively in the near term, uh, because they will be there then as a, as part of our thinking, so that when the decision is time to make a decision or evaluate an option or consider a proposal, that we will be able to use these for that purpose. That's, that's where this is coming from. So what you're gonna see are some fairly high level uh, ideas with, with a, few, a few areas where we dip down into some specifics, but the, the, the thought is that we would develop a shared uh, understanding of where we wanna go. So I'm gonna talk about those four categories. The first one being buildings. And this uh, is, so we're talking about public buildings and private buildings. Uh, in the area of, of public buildings. So, so buildings are critical. It's, it's maybe the most important thing for our sustainability plan because uh, improving sustainability in buildings requires a very long view. I mean, choices that we make for our buildings uh, get baked in for years and, and sometimes decades. So we propose adopting clean energy goals for Reading. That means moving our public buildings away from fossil fuels to, to uh, renewable energy or other you know, non, non fossil, uh, non emitting uh, forms of energy. And that includes things like clean energy improvements when we consider new heating systems or uh, that we should entertain uh, adding solar energy or energy efficiency, that we should have goals and plans for all of those things, uh, that we should become a green community and tap into the uh, funding that's available through that. Um, that we should consider uh, the risks to our buildings in our municipal vulnerability preparedness uh, plan. A big part of this is, is, uh, is that we need to adopt a holistic thinking. I mean, green community, MVP, or other goals should be one thought. Uh, and we want to we want to talk about how green community fits into what we're what we're trying to do, or how our MVP, MVP plans reflect what we want to do. Uh, and, and there will be other programs, I'm sure, that, that crop up uh, that we want to be able to, to include in this in this holistic picture. So we're, we're also considering you know, climate change as we go. So think of uh, public buildings in, in, in the sense of MVP. Think of, think of public buildings as a community resource, like with, with providing maybe refrigerators or sources of electricity for, for residents to charge their, their you know, devices and so forth. If, if we really get into problems with, you know, with uh, electricity loss from, from climate. Uh, similarly, in private buildings, this is where we, we uh, support adopting the stretch energy code. 
that's now up to 284 towns have, have, a, have adopted the Spanish Energy Code as of August uh, 25th. Uh, we, and Reading should, should be one of the, one of the next. Uh, we encourage fuel switching from fossil fuels to electricity for the same kind of reasons that I've been mentioning that, uh, and we can do this by um, in part creating a list of green builders who knows how to who knows how to build these kinds of buildings, and let's tell our, our residents about them that they know they exist, um, and and let's uh, join the uh, the Mass CEC Heat Smart program for heat pumps. Now, some of these things have to be done in conjunction with RMLD. That's fine. You know, I, I think there again, it's the holistic view that that matters to us. Um, we also want to, of course, encourage our homeowners. Uh, and our, and our uh, commercial uh, owners to adopt clean energy uh, solutions and energy uh, efficiency, have home energy audits, have a, a reading driven uh, awareness programs on energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, we suggest adopting the, the CPACE program, the commercial property assessed clean energy uh, uh, capability to, to fund a, a, you know, clean energy improvements in our commercial uh, you know, buildings. Um, so the next category is uh, transportation. So the buildings and the transportation, are, I think, are the most urgent. Um, and they also are tied to a number of the things that we're doing. Uh, you know, the green communities uh, says that we would have, if we wanted to, if we wanted to become a green community, we would have to adopt a plan to switch to more fuel efficient uh, vehicle, but we think that we think the right solution here is for Reading to embrace electric vehicles, uh, and we should encourage a, a conversion of our of our fleet to electric vehicles to the extent that we can uh, over time. So we want to transition fleet. We, we also want to provide uh, and encourage ample electrical vehicle electric vehicle charging stations. So this means, for example adding electric vehicle charging stations to our town parking lots or modi modifying our building codes so that when a new parking lot is built uh, within the town, that it includes uh, electric vehicle charging stations or modifying our building codes so that new construction of commercial or residential properties that include at least 10 parking spots also have uh, electric vehicle charging stations. So this becomes, um, you know, this becomes, um, a change to our building code a little it goes beyond um, what the what the stretch energy code would would necessarily make us do. Um, then we want also just more parking and bicycle options in Reading. Uh, we want to see what, what the diet the road diet is going to take us. We realize that's going on for a while, but but the goals of the road diet, whether we uh, end up embracing that or not, um, are are goals that that make sense for us. I mean, reductions of accidents. Uh, you know, more uh, ped pedestrian, uh, safer for pedestrians and, and more places to uh, have bicycles and, and uh, walking lanes and so forth. So I think that's, those are all important. And this ties also when we talk about charging stations, for example, we're tying the, this thought back to the electrification of buildings idea. So these things go together again, trying to have a holistic picture. Um, move on from that to um, talking about food. So here's, here's a case where um, we're, we wanna see local sourcing of food that we're, wherever we can. Um, it, it decreases the transportation and you know, emissions costs of providing food. Uh, it increases uh, the, sec the security of the supply uh, of food that we, if we, if we emphasize local um, produce and local food. And so one of the thoughts here was, was supporting for farmers markets. Now, this is a, with, there are farmers markets in our areas and we would first recommend that these be supported and, and encouraged and, and uh, advertised. Uh, maybe eventually Reading should have its own farmers market, um, whether, you know, however long that takes uh, this, you know, we, sh we should still be pushing the farmers markets that are in our area because they also provide uh, local food. Uh, another idea is, is establishing community gardens, you know, as, where where uh, residents could could have they could have their little garden spot. I mean, it's a good teaching vehicle. Um, it's also just an opportunity for people to to 
again, provide their own food locally and and at some at some level, you know, share it in the in the town. Uh, procuring local food for schools and towns and town events. Uh, this is just I, th this is mostly again. It's all the reasons I mentioned, but it's also for just some participation. Um, you know, people, you know. Let let our residents get involved in in dealing with the supplying of food, and, as opposed to uh, just shipping it all in. So this is this may be one of the areas that we're not going to jump on right away because we're worrying about green communities or something. But this is but uh, but by having these kind of ideas in a in a master plan, when it comes up, we would have already thought about it. We would have a reason to go one way or another. We would have a reason. To with the farmer's market or a community garden, if we could come to some kind of agreement uh, as a town. And last, um, certainly not least, health. Um, we need to, uh, this, this ties to um, the municipal vulnerability preparedness program again. Um, we need to plan for more severe weather events. Um, the, the, the experience that Connecticut had in, in Isaias uh, the, the experience that Louisiana had in Hurricane Laura, the experience that California is having with the, um, the wildfires, is that the disaster events are just mega size. You know that that they're getting. It's it's not just that we have an, a, a storm and, and we lose electricity. We're having a storm that's taking out a whole region and is and we're losing electricity for weeks. You know or or towns are being endangered. I think we need to think in those terms in Reading. We need to think of what, what what would a real disaster look like? What would we do for our population? What kind of emergency procedures? Man, I never even switched that. I never even, um, what kind of emergency procedures would we have for vulnerable populations? And, and, and maybe we even have some, you know, some sort of uh, simulations or some sort of practice events of how we would deal with it. I think our municipal buildings, again, all the way back to buildings, these become a critical resource, not just for shelters, but not just for shelters, but it's something that might have to sustain people, a place for them to put their medicines or whatever, you know, over, over a very long period of time. And I think we need to expect that, that our uh, weather disasters are gonna be more disastrous in the future. Uh, and then, so creating a community facilities for use by the residents. Again, this, this comes full circle back to our to plans for our buildings. And, and I think this is another area where uh, it, it should be and it should be in our long-term thinking. We may not have any programs on it right away. Maybe it, maybe we do because of the MVP, but that's uh, you know, that's that's just another part of, of, a, of a master plan. So this is what I hope the select board will embrace. That is part of a is part of a big picture, uh, and adopt ideas at this level, and then as we as we dive into them, as we dive into uh, you know a, a program to adopt uh, to become a green community or or to decide what we actually want to propose for maybe for a pro uh, program for MVP those kind of things, these these kind of high level goals will guide us, and uh, and so that's our recommendation. So I'll leave it there. Mark. Thanks, David. Uh, board members, questions? Um, David, I just want to thank you. I think it's phenomenal. I love the, the presentation in the deck and, and the summary you gave here. Um, you know, your timing is really perfect in coming to talk to us because we're actually in the process of discussing the town manager goals. And some of the things I had flagged um, were sustainability, vehicles, buildings, et cetera, um, and setting timelines for, for um, when we can expect plans to be developed of that nature. Um, so you've done a tremendous amount of legwork. This is so um, just timely. So thank you. Um, I'm actually going to be incorporating some of your uh, comments into my goals now. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm excited and you have my full support. Well, thank you. Questions, comments, other board members? Anne. I, I have a process question and a sort of jurisdiction question. Um, so who would be creating such a master plan and who would be adopting such a master plan? Well, I mean, Reading has plans, has economic development plans, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I know you all are considering things like parking plans and so forth. These are all, these are all big picture plans. I mean, I mean, 
we think of it in pieces or we, or we uh, evaluate it in pieces, but I guess I, I put all that together and, and, and describe that as a master plan. I don't know that there is a master plan document per se. Okay, um, so it's not, it's not um, sort of the, an official term Master not plan. not that I know of. No, I mean we could make it that if it if it helped. But I but I, I just what I I propose that more as a concept that okay. that we don't that we do when we talk about our economic development we also talk talk about sustainability. You know when we talk mm -hmm. about you know uh, any major changes in the town or where we want to go or where we want to be in ten years twenty years whatever that that this is another dimension and it's an important dimension it's another set of criteria that we would. That we would include, and and I think uh, that's it's, it's it makes it easier to describe and defend uh, uh, whatever it is that we that we want to end up doing. You know, it just if they all if everything fits together, at least it's, it's so that in, in the in the if the puzzle pieces fit, then then we can see the picture, right? So so how do we do this, or who's who's responsible? I guess the select board ultimately may be, but. Who creates these plans? What documents are they incorporated into? Who adopts them, et cetera? Looks like Vanessa has yeah, the answer. So do you want to be addressing <laughs> that? <laughs> uh, this is, um, so uh, there's many people and many um, groups and committees that have authority over this um, when it comes to certain things like um, buildings and transportation that falls um, under the town manager, so that's also the select board. When we talk about um, zoning and buildings and requirements, we now are talking about bylaw, we're talking about CPDC. Um, so, you know, David has, and, and the Climate Advisory Committee have very nicely put this together into a package, but I think more broadly speaking, it's a philosophy in how we approach future developments in town um, and future expenses um, when we talk about HVAC systems, for example. So um, it's, it's not a one-stop shop where we can say, you know, X person has authority. I think this is really a collaborative effort between all of these different groups. Um, school committee is another one that could weigh in here. RMLD um, are the obvious ones. So I would say if, if this is the direction that we want to go in, and I certainly hope it is, then I think it would be prudent to have a much larger meeting um, to incorporate all of the all stakeholders in, in this. Um, to incorporate cut all the stakeholders on this. I cut out for a moment and I missed some okay. of what you said, Vanessa, my apologies, but I'm hearing joint ownership, multiple stakeholders. Yes, so I think it would be prudent to have a broader meeting with CPDC, yeah, you know, we can include the library if we think that, that there are partners in this as well. The schools, um, I think FinCom obviously plays a part, obviously the town staff. Um, I know I, I left someone out, obviously Climate Advisory, CPDC. Um, so a, a sort of a joint meeting to say, is this direction we wanna go in? The term master plan has a state definition that right. is very specific. Right. And so, right. you know, if we, I've raised the issue a couple of times now of updating the master plan. Um, it's done by staff, it's very labor intensive. So perhaps we can label it something else so that we don't go sort of to that extent if that's not the direction we wanna go in. But I, I think we need to partner with our colleagues to make this happen. Otherwise, um, everyone's sort of operating independently and there may, we may miss something or opportunities that would otherwise be available. Yeah, and similarly, where the master, the concept of master plan is, a, I think, a state concept um, for municipalities. The built, the building code is a statewide um, code, I believe. And of course, we have our own individual community municipal bylaws. Um, but that, that's my understanding and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. And the stretch code is an example of that in terms of it uh, being specific to, to a, a bylaw, uh, a town bylaw. Mm -hmm. Karen. Ian, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, 
as a liaison to the Climate Advisory Committee, you know, I appreciate how quickly they turn this around. And then the question is, so what can we do with it in our right. community's master plan? None of this is covered under sustainability. It says thou shalt recycle. Um, so, but if this is something we want to do, and I, I think there's a lot of support for it in the community, how do we get it out there? How do we get it? <clears throat> whether I, I had thoughts about whether this needs to be presented at town meeting, um, given more prominence on our website. If you go and look at the town of Winchester, sustainability is one of the first things you see. Um, it's front and center. So um, yeah, I've been struggling with not codifying this, but, but at the same time, taking steps to implement some of this. Yeah, I, I should clarify, I do like what, what I'm hearing. I'm just sort of curious about concrete yeah, how. action steps to how to effectuate the the very um, well-received ideas you presented. So. It, 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 go ahead, Bob, sorry. Um, thanks. Um, you know, I, I think Vanessa has a really nice summary of this. Um, I'd like to sit down probably with David, maybe with the committee, but I know David and I work well um, and understand some of the comments he's made about your past plans and, and maybe something that hasn't been implemented because um, the Climate um, Advisory Committee has put together past plans and some of it did require town changes. And as far as I know, we made a lot of changes. Uh, and I don't mean to suggest the changes from 10 years ago are sufficient. But I think um, before you gather a lot of people, probably a helpful exercise when I meet with David is to make sure that all of you have an inventory about what does exist. Maybe it's called a different thing. Maybe it's tucked in a corner somewhere. Uh, but for instance, when David was describing the emergency planning, as Mark knows, we have a lot of those. So I just want to make sure that, you know, before you gather a lot of people together, that there's a good foundation built as to what's needed and what's there and what needs to change. It's an excellent point. Um, so, but it can take a different flavor, whereas before we would have just installed another gas line to be our municipal vulnerability backup system. And now we can take a broader approach. What other kind of backup systems can we have? Um, can these community centers, like David's specific example, if we need, if the climate is getting hotter and we need residents to go to say the senior center or someplace that is cool and store a medications. So part of a, a, an MVP plan for that could be how do we make that plan greener? How do we not keep relying on fossil fuels to achieve some of these things? So no question, I know you've been doing a lot of emergency planning, Bob. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting approach that he's describing almost like when we prepare for a specific weather related emergency that we're more broadly prepared. So not just let's open the senior center for a cooling center, but let's have that ability longer term. And so for instance, there's some municipal buildings that should have generators that don't because for a one day or two day event, it's okay, we don't need them. But for a longer planning like this, we should think differently. So um, yeah, I, I think there's um, some thinking that needs to go into this and we should be able to come up with some suggestions. David, how- And then a bigger meeting I think would be an excellent idea. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it feels like RMLD would be a very natural partner in a lot of the things we're we're talking about, particularly on uh, certainly in, in uh, preparedness and things like that. Maybe less so on food, but yeah. um, you know, I'm wondering: have they already been engaged with you? Do they have a liaison that's working with you? I'm just wondering, kind of where where are things already? I I, I take Bob's uh, Vanessa's point. Bob's point is spot on. It's great, and that's the way I think to kind of build this, figure out what we need, and then start kind of broadening people like you know the way we have financial forms maybe there's a sustainability forum at some point that takes place because I think you'll find there are a lot of different pieces that touch this just as you laid out but it feels like RMLD could be playing a big uh, role here and it certainly fits if it's their mission if it's everything have, have they been engaged already or is that something that, that we should talk about working on as well well uh, they that's something that we have been engaged with RMLD all all along they did not participate in this particular analysis, but but we left out a whole, there's the, the things that I, I probably should have said as I show these, we were focused on things that Reading could do. Um, we, there's, there's another page, I guess, 
of, of things that pertain to energy. I mean, RML, and uh, we meet with, with RMLD regularly. Uh, Chuck Underhill comes and meets with the committee and we talk about you know, their plans. Uh, uh, you know, they have to have energy efficiency plans. So, I mean, they have, they have like three major um, you know, initiatives that are, that are central to this. They have a clean energy uh, initiative, they have a, a energy efficiency initiative, and they have an electrification initiative. And all of those three things tie completely into this. And many of the things that we would propose to do would, would n don't make any sense at all if, if RMLD isn't right in the middle of it. So, um, you know, I, no, they are absolutely a partner in this. Awesome. We're, I think, hoping to have kind of a, a joint meeting of sorts to take place uh, at some point in the future. Maybe it's October-ish. Um, but we should talk about that also, uh, more for them to kind of lay out some of the things they're already doing and for us to all understand where there are good overlaps that we can take advantage of. Well, interestingly enough, you know, RMLD is updating their own sustainability plan right now. Hmm. Timing is everything, isn't it? <laughs> Denise, I didn't, I, uh, I meant to, to ask if you had any comments right after David, and I apologize, I, I, I didn't, but let me do that now. That's quite all right. Um, I'm all set and I'm oh, great with what David has said. So I'm all set. Thank you. Great. Uh, other questions or comments on the board? Mark? Carl? I just had a question for David. Um, it was a good presentation. I read through everything. And just a question on where did the 10 vehicles or more come from? Is that a are other cities and towns doing that for the EV or the just the electrical um, conduit supply to be there or like 10 parking spots to me is not a big building. Oh, you're muted, David. Yeah, so there that language was 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 borrowed from somewhere and I don't remember or right offhand where it is. I will I will find that out and, and let you know, but we did not we did not make it up, you know. It was it was a recommended language, um, and the, the ten. Uh, no, I mean ten parking spots is not. Um, that's, not that's not a huge building, but then I think when we're talking about electrical vehicle charging stations, um, the idea is to have them be um, readily available. So um, it wouldn't it, it's not that hard. But that's an that's an interesting area, by the way. Where where RMLD has been working very hard, they they uh, they have some partnerships that they're working on where the um, with certain suppliers, certain vendors, the the charging station itself is almost free. the The expense of of, of the charging station is pretty much getting power to where it would be. You know, so I mean, the building, you know, trenching and conduit and stuff like that. The actual charging stations uh, under with, some, with certain vendors is is practically free, so I don't I don't think it needs to be a big cost driver, but it just says that that we um, you know we just would encourage it to be built in from the beginning because of course you know when you're when, when the issue is is the utility you know you really want to be digging up the concrete in the beginning you know not not later not more than once yeah. Great. Thanks, folks. And I'll take that as an action about where the where that number came from. The, the Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks, folks. Appreciate your coming in. And thanks for sharing the presentation. Uh, very helpful for, for our thinking. I, obviously, uh, I think that Vanessa hit it square on and Bob in terms of let's let's kind of understand where we are, what we've got, and then talk about uh, the groups that should get engaged to help um, establish this, let's not call it a master plan, but kind of an overarching plan so that we don't get caught up in, in words. Cool. Thanks, folks. Thank um, you. So next on our list was uh, vote to sponsor stretch code bylaw. I'm going to suggest if it's okay with the rest of the board, let the uh, Reading Coalition, um, who was probably in the waiting room, let them uh, come on and, and speak first, and then we'll come back. I mean, maybe we'll take a, a five minute break and then we can come back. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Okay, so let's do that. So please let's let in Sammy and, and uh... oh, I'm drawing a blank for a moment. There she is, Erica. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Sammy. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi, everybody. Good, good. Hi, Erica. Hi. Thank you for having us. Oh, thanks for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Please okay. tell us what's going on. Is it okay if I share my screen? Please. Okay. All right. Can folks see that okay? All right. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, Mark is our liaison um, to the Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support Board, um, our advisory board, and thought it would be great for us to come and give you the annual update that we like to do. But I just want to start off um, and just let you know a little bit about our coalition. We fall under the police department, under the town of Reading. Um, Bob is one of our huge day-to-day -day supporters and our chief of police, as well as superintendent of schools. Um, we work very closely with the key town partners. So I'm just gonna kind of walk you through a little bit about the coalition and then give you some highlights on what we've been working on during COVID. So as most of you know, the coalition actually started um, from the select board. Um, the select board was one of the key um, driving forces that uh, allowed the formation of the coalition back in 2006. We're formally, we're known as Ready Coalition Against Substance Abuse. We went through a renaming over the last year. We wanted our name to more acknowledge our current mission, which is to focus um, on prevention and support. And we've expanded a little bit beyond substance misuse. Um, we do some mental health promotion as well. So we wanted our name to reflect that. Um, so our primarily goals have been on improving collaboration and reducing substance use. And today we offer programs and services that go beyond the substance misuse prevention and focus on mental health promotion. So one of the first resources that I wanna mention is a really important resource that we collaborate with William James College for called our Interface Referral Service. Our partnership with them started in 2016. Um, this was a program that we were able to fund with the support of the hospital trustees. At the beginning, they launched our pilot project with us. And then we also received grant funding to get this project going. Um, since um, 2016, we've had over 300 residents use the service to match with outpatient licensed mental health professionals. So I just want to kind of walk you through a little bit about how the service has been helpful and also a little bit about how folks can find out more information and use this um, if they need it for their families. So it's a confidential service. We contract with William James College. They're formerly known as the Mass School of Professional Psychology. So some folks know them by them that name, but they were renamed a few years ago. Um, they operate the Interface Referral Service. Callers um, are matched with licensed mental health professionals from their database. There's over a thousand credentialed providers in the database that specialize in different forms of therapeutic support. Um, each referral meets the location, insurance, and specialty needs of the caller, and they do have telehealth um, services available for folks, um, obviously, during, during COVID. That's been greatly expanded, which has been amazing. Just to give you a little background about folks that use the service, so we've had 308 families call into our William James College Reading contract, and when they call in, they um, are asked a number of questions to get a sense of how they can be helped by the intake um, counselor. And they give presenting concerns of what they're concerned about. So for example, a mom might call in and say, I'm concerned that my 12 year old is, is displaying some, maybe some worrisome signs. The school's a little worried about anxiety. I'm looking for an outpatient provider that might specialize in dealing with um, preteens and anxiety. So a presenting concern might be anxiety. So of the 308 callers that have used the service since 2016, the majority have called in as a presenting concern for anxiety, followed by depression and then ADHD, um, as well as behavioral issues, social issues, stress, addictions, and suicidal ideation. What's interesting is addictions is only 5% of folks presenting concern. That is not surprising to Sammy or I um, and folks that work with people who are struggling with substance misuse. It's often not the starting point for people wanting to change their life. Sometimes they might come at it from a different perspective. They might wanna start with a different issue. Um, but one of the amazing things that's happened in the behavioral health community is we now have um, co-occurring disorder treatment. So as folks move into treatment and therapeutic supports, um, they will be asked questions about substance misuse, and that may open the door for them to possibly get on the path to recovery. So it doesn't always present as a starting point, but it doesn't mean it won't get addressed. So I just want to point that out that uh, it's very important to have a little bit of a broader perspective to make sure that we get people in for care. 
Um, just to give folks a sense of what to expect if they were to call the helpline, when they call, they'll speak with a referral counselor that is trained by the William James College. They're typically master or doctoral level students that are attending William James College. Um, they receive a very extensive training. Um, they'll complete a confidential intake with the Reading caller for takes about 15, 20 minutes. They'll be asked specific information like email, phone number, the concerns a person can call for themselves, their child. Um, they can call for a spouse or an elderly fam family member, but it is important that that person be part of the process. So in order to get information for someone, they do have to be part of the process. Um, and then they also look at what are some of the timeframes that folks might be available for appointments. So one of the reasons why we wanted to have the service available to folks is we heard from the community that it was very difficult sometimes to find a provider that they could get to that was open when their child was available um, and that was affordable. So the interface referral matching process takes all of that into consideration. Um, once they focus on making a match, the referral counselor then goes back to the database, takes a few days to search for providers. One of the unique services that they provide is they reach out to providers to say, I have a mom with a 12 year old that's looking for support around anxiety. Do you have room in your practice to take on a new patient? So it saves the person from calling um, lots of front desks to ask that, that question. William James kind of takes that off their plate to make sure that they're actually available. Um, once the referral counselor has identified two or three matches that could work for a family, they'll call back or reach out by email if that's what the folk, folks prefer, and they'll give them their provider's name and credentials, location, and phone number. Um, and then they'll follow up to make sure that um, it worked out, that they made an appointment, that they were able to connect. And um, once that process is completed, they close the referral, but we do have people who call back. Um, we've had about 10% of our users call back for another concern or family member. So that also is helpful for us to know that people liked the service when they first used it and went back and, and asked for more help, which is great. Um, so this is the way that folks can get access to the interface helpline. It's open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but you can leave a voicemail after hours and they will get back to you. There's also a website. The phone number is 1-888-244-6843. And all of this information is on our Reading Coalition website, which you can link through the town or the school website. And we'll share that at the end of our presentation. So before I move on to other projects. I just want to check in and see if folks have any questions about interface before we move on. All good. Okay. Great. Um, so a few prevention projects that I want to mention are two long term projects that we have worked on for many years. Uh, we have created a mental health first aid program in our community. It started about seven years ago. Since we started the program with the Reading Public Schools, the police department and the town, we've trained over 800 people in mental health and youth mental health first aid. That's a, a day long training typically where folks get um, advice and support on how they could become a first aider. Basically to provide the same type of first aid you would um, if it was a physical injury um, with emotional support. So it's a very popular program. During COVID, we have learned to teach the program virtually. The National Council on Behavioral Health oversees the program in the United States and they were able to deploy new resources for us to do that. Uh, CMA and I just taught a class um, this past month in August uh, for the new teachers, the new teacher induction. There were 27 folks that just got recently certified. And as part of our mental health first aid trainings, we also involve our school resource officers and, and other resources that might be beneficial to folks getting trained. So it's a great program and it's available. We will be teaching more classes this fall that's open to residents. Many of our residents have taken it, but we'll be letting folks know how they can take it virtually for the first time. We also are part of something called the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition. It's a partnership across our region of seven communities and involves Medford, Malden, Melrose, Wakefield, Stoneham, and Winchester. And together over the last seven years, we have worked to focus on opioid prevention as well as underage drinking prevention. And as a regional community, we've done a number of extensive projects, um, data collection analysis, and um, we meet uh, about twice a month. And so we're very engaged and I will say, during um, when COVID first happened, the Mystic Valley connection for us was extremely valuable for Sammy and I. Um, one of the benefits that, that we 
benefit from as part of the coalition is they provide professional development resources for us to attend trainings. And Sammy and I were, were able to get um, over 40 hours of um, professional development training sponsored by the Mystic Valley, as well as be part of a number of um, online uh, webinars and trainings that helped us get ready to be more available remotely, as well as they sponsor our Zoom subscription. So that has been very, very useful. We have used that quite a bit. I want to um, turn it over to Sammy to talk a little bit about some of our intervention projects and our resources. Some of you may not know Sammy. She's um, been working with us since October of 2019. She has been an amazing outreach coordinator for us. Um, we're so happy to have her full time with Bob's support and Chief Clark's support. Um, as well as the superintendent of schools, we were able to have a full-time position and they were part of the hiring process to bring Sammy on. So Sammy's a great resource and I'll turn it over to her to talk a little bit about our chemical health and CIT programs. Thank you, Erica. And so as Erica mentioned, we wanted to share some information with you all about two of our primary uh, intervention projects. So the first is the Chemical Health Education Program, and we have partnered with the Reading Public School District for this program. And this was put in place to provide students who may violate the school substance use or chemical health policies with an opportunity to receive some education and support rather than simply a punitive measure. So for example, if a student is caught vaping on school grounds, instead of simply suspending that student, we implemented a program where that student would actually be referred to take a chemical health class with myself and with one of the wellness teachers, Michelle Hopkinson. And in that class, we talk about decision-making and accountability, as well as helping students understand a little bit more about the role that substances could play in their life and what addiction looks like. And this gives us a great opportunity, again, to provide education and support for students, and also allows me to be able to work with students one-on-one -on -one to figure out if there's a deeper issue, if a student requires some additional support around mental health or substance use concerns. And this gives us a chance to connect back with the parents. So we're able to hear from the parents if they have concerns, if they've maybe noticed a change in their child's behavior. So this has been a great opportunity for us to reach out and support both students and families and try to intervene at a very early level if we have concerns about a student's substance use. And in the past academic year, we had 19 students complete this program with us. And one of the other intervention projects that we've been very excited about is the Crisis Intervention Team, or CIT. And this Crisis Intervention Team is something that comes from a national initiative by the Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, really looking for a push towards police departments offering increased behavioral health services. And so the seeds for this program started in Reading about three years ago when several officers attended the CIT training to learn additional skills for supporting people who may be having a mental health or substance use crisis that officers respond to. So at this time, we have just a little over a third of the police department has gone through this training, which is an impressive number. It's a very extensive training. It's, it's a 40 hour training. So officers have to commit a lot of time to go and, and get this done. And what we starting in January were able to implement is a follow-up piece. And so now any mental health or substance use related call for service that comes in for the that comes into the police department will receive a follow up phone call. So we will reach out to people after the fact and check in and see how they're doing in a calmer moment. If they need services, you know, do they need a therapist? Do they know how to find one? Are they concerned about a loved one with a substance use issue? And so this has been a really exciting program for us because it gives us that chance to connect back to the community and offer some support after something scary has happened when the police have had to respond, again, for either a mental health or a substance use concern. And so since piloting this program, we've been doing this since uh, January of this year, we have made 152 follow-up phone calls to Reading residents. Um, and we work in partnership on this program, you know, first with the Reading Police Department, who have been a tremendous support for us in getting this going, as well as with the Respond Domestic Violence Counselor, who is stationed part-time at the Police Department. She typically will handle follow-up on any domestic violence incidences. 
um, whereas I will handle follow up for any mental health or substance use concerns. And we also work very closely with the town human and elder services. So concerns involving an elder in town, we then pass that information um, over to them as the experts and coordinate to make sure that the needs of the community are being met. Um, do, do we have any questions on that or else I'll jump into some resources. Okay, Karen. Hi, Karen. Just a quick question. I know 220 is one for the books. Um, does it seem like the use of the program is more this year than previous years? Is there a trend? For the CIT program or for the chemical health education? Actually for both. Definitely. So we are certainly have seen, I'll start with CIT. We definitely have seen an uptick in recent months, you know, especially since kind of March onward with substance use calls. And um, so we are seeing an increase in people struggling with substance use concerns as well as mental health concerns. Um, you know, certainly we know that isolation is a huge factor for people who are struggling with their sobriety or who are working towards their sobriety, as well as for people with mental health concerns. You know, that lack of connection can be really, really challenging. So we have seen an uptick in the past several months with the CIT program. Um, and I will add as well, we have gotten, as I said, I think we've done 152 calls and we have had overwhelming positive support. People have been so, so appreciative of these phone calls. And we at first were interested to see what the feedback would be from the community and from people receiving this type of follow-up, but it has been overwhelmingly positive. And as far as the chemical health education program is concerned, that one's been a little bit trickier. So with students not being in school, they haven't been receiving the, the violations or they haven't been in violation of school policy. So we haven't been getting referrals necessarily in that same avenue. However, we have continued to work with students who we were connected with before the school closing and have continued to hear from school staff, school administration, as well as parents around concerns related to students. So we have continued to support students throughout the pandemic, even though the avenue for referral has looked a little different but we are up and ready to go. I have been working with the support of Erica and with Michelle Hopkinson to convert the chemical health education program to be able to be run virtually. So we are ready to go for this school year to either provide that curriculum in person or via Zoom, depending on how the pandemic shakes out. Jamie, should I move to the next slide for you? I think we had a question from oh. Anne. Yes, uh, Sammy, thank you, and, and Erica, thank you so much for this presentation. I really was not aware of the crisis intervention team pilot program. That's um, really encouraging and exciting uh, work that you're doing. I was wondering, for residents who might be, you know, not necessarily knowing what they need, um, you know, they don't know that they're looking for outpatient mental health services and wouldn't know to call William James, they also, um, may not know whether they're in crisis or not. Um, can, can residents call um, the Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support for, for further direction? Um, I know the two of you are certainly highly qualified. I know there's been some talk about the police department perhaps bringing in um, a, 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 a psychiatric social worker. I'm not sure if that's the, the right terminology. Um, I, I was wondering if you could speak to, to that. Absolutely. So Erica and I are absolutely resources for the community. And we do have people who reach out to us looking for support. And um, so we certainly work with members of the community if they call and are looking for resources or have questions about what's available. But I think that you hit on a really important point. And that's one of the big things we've seen with the crisis intervention team is that a lot of times people don't always know exactly what they need or really know what the resources are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has been a part of the reason why the response has been so overwhelmingly positive has been that when we're able to reach out in a calm moment, I am able to take the time to really explain to somebody what their options are, what services we have, but also hear from them what their concerns are. And mm -hmm. so we're able to kind of work through together what some of these presenting issues may be. And then between Erica and I, we're usually able to come up with a, a pretty good plan of a referral for them to help them connect to the appropriate professionals. But I think it definitely is 
you know, a big piece of that is being available to talk with people and troubleshoot and figure out, you know, what is it that they need? What is it that their family needs? And how can we support them in accessing the appropriate professional? Great. And I, I imagine human and elder services is sometimes the first point of contact for people. Sometimes it's the police department. Sometimes it's the Reading Coalition. Um, and so it's a matter of, of connecting people to the right resources, um, regardless of what their first point of contact is. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the reasons why the CIT program was created was to offer additional law enforcement training as first responders responding to a scene to be more empathetic and to be more understanding of mental health. But then also sometimes it is a, a family or a person's way into getting access to more support. Um, one of the tricky things for first responders is at the scene, they're dealing with the most immediate crisis. And so they were, over the past few years, we have been promoting resources and encouraging folks to use the Elliott Mobile Crisis Service, which is our regional crisis mobilization service, as well as interface referral service. But what we recognize is that when people are in a crisis, it's hard to take in information. It's just not the time. Um, so now having the follow-up phone call when folks uh, have a little bit of time to kind of figure out where they want to head next. And sometimes people don't know where, but we're here to talk that through with them. Sammy and I are both not clinicians. We do not play a clinical role. Um, that is a resource that some police departments have. Um, our partners in Wakefield have that as part of their CIT program. And it's definitely something that I know the chief, um, you know, has, has talked about. But one of the reasons why um, we're trying to pilot CIT is to kind of see how does it work for us and what are some of the needs that might pop up. So we already are gathering a lot of data and information about what are the presenting concerns, what are the most asked for supports and services. Um, Sammy's done everything from connect people with getting health insurance to talking barriers through about um, how to encourage their young person to actually sign on to counseling. Um, so there's lots of different barriers that come up for people. And I also encourage people to call Interface directly if they're not sure what they need. It's a very common question that the intake counselors get is sometimes folks will just say, I, I don't know. I'm worried about my child's behavior and I don't know where to go. So we often encourage people to check in with primary care as well as check in with the Interface Referral Service because through the intake process, they can help identify some possible next steps. So it is um, a resource either way, even if folks aren't sure. Um, so just to throw that out there that folks can definitely contact Sammy or I, but we can also direct them to more specialized resources. You mentioned very, I, and I, you mentioned quickly and I, I didn't quite uh, uh, catch it. Um, when people are in crisis, you refer them to some kind of regional Perfect. Yes. So um, throughout the state, there is a regional crisis service for particular communities. We are part of the Elliott service area. Um, Winchester and beyond uses a company or a nonprofit program called Advocates. So if folks can call Elliott 24 seven, if they're in a mental health crisis okay. and um, clinicians are able to be deployed to a location or they can assist um, over the phone or set up an outpatient uh, intake. Um, we also use this quite a bit in our school system. Um, the mobile crisis unit will come out to a school and do an assessment for a child with a parent's permission. Um, so it's a service that's used very frequently in our community. And we definitely have a lot of residents that utilize Elliott as an outpatient mental health provider. Um, so it's a service that we work with a lot. Um, I did wanna mention one other service that we're connected to that I think is very beneficial. Sammy, could you talk a little bit about the hub um, just to kind of let them know about the broader resources that we can have access to. Absolutely. So the hub team is a model for a an interdisciplinary response team of people who are assisting people in crisis. And so the the regional hub that we have been able to attend from Reading is actually hosted in Medford. But a lot of the same providers that cover the Reading area you know, also work in Medford. So it's a good connection for us to have with this, this Medford team. And the hub is comprised of many different organizations and entities. So it's usually representatives from the police department, from the Board of Health, from the, um, the homelessness services, from local hospitals, from Elliott certainly has a representative, the Department of Mental Health, Mystic Valley Elder Services, as well as the more local contingents. So representatives from coalitions or from other similar 
uh, programs who are managing or overseeing the CIT program. And so this is a really, really helpful program because it gets all of these different providers in the same room or more recently on the same Zoom call. So we're able to present cases of people whose needs maybe surpass those that we have available to us at the local level. We're able to bring that concern to our bigger regional team and tap into some additional resources. And this is all done uh, confidentially. So people's information is protected. You know, typically the name of the person in question is not released um, to the group only after, only in a small discussion after with whoever the appropriate service provider has been identified. Um, and so, you know, we have been able to utilize the hub team when we had residents who had um, really challenging mental health concerns that felt like they were past the, the capacity of some of our local resources. And we were able to connect on the spot with representatives from the Department of Mental Health and from, uh, and from Elliot. And by the end of the meeting, we had an outreach plan in place for this person. So it's a really, really great resource to have to take some of those cases where we've done what we can and we're still really struggling to get that additional support. Great. Um, oh, not one more follow up on Elliot mental health. Do I understand correctly that so if someone is in uh, someone in Reading is in a mental health crisis, they could call 911 and they would be attended to by the police department with follow up from the crisis intervention team, or they could directly call Elliot Mental Health and they would be directly connected with um, uh, clinician first responders. Is that a fair? Yes, um, the okay. tricky thing is um, the Elliot um, Mobile Crisis Unit does cover a wide region. So it depends on how quickly they can get someone out. Um, typically they say that they try to respond within two hours of a call. Okay. With okay. COVID, my guess is they're probably trying to do a lot more telehealth and virtual support. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that our police department will do is they will involve Elliot if um, that is something that they can do on the spot. So they will call Elliot if needed. Um, if a person calls 911 first, but then says, oh, I wanted to involve Elliot, the police can do that, they're in close contact. Um, but it is a resource and it's part of our resource list that Samuel will talk about that gives more information on how Elliot works. And if folks live in other communities or work in other communities, um, there's a state website an emergency mobilization crisis where they can search by zip code for what their local regional group is. Um, but it is an amazing support and service and it's open 24 seven. Um, some of the counselors have gone through our mental health first aid training and they have said, I'm awake at three in the morning and I'm taking calls. So if someone wants to talk to me, I'm going to answer the phone no matter what. So it's okay for people to call, ask questions, um, talk about a family member, um, and they will do their best. The only tricky bit that I'll let people know is the person who's receiving services must give consent. So the adult that is asked that needs the service has to give consent. We can't, Elliot cannot force a service. Um, unless the person is sectioned um, through another procedure by police. Um, if it's a child, a parent can consent for the child, um, but just something to be aware of, which is often sometimes why folks will use 911 and mobile crisis and kind of work with them both. But our officers are very familiar with Elliot and that's been part of their training is to use that service more and that support if they have questions as well. Does that answer? Yes, this okay. has been very informative. Thank you. Great. Appreciate it. A time check with you guys. I think you're on your last couple of slides. If yeah, I... we're almost there. We've, we've just got one quick one, um, and this is a really fast one. Sammy, I'll let you talk a little bit about resources and let folks know how to find them. Yes, perfect. Um, so we have, uh, I know we've, we've touched on a couple of different resources, but we have compiled a resource guide with some more COVID specific resources. So things like virtual um, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous uh, meetings, um, supports for parents on how to talk to children about COVID-19, resources for helping families transition back into the school year. So this is a really, really great guide that we have put together. We're keeping updated with resources as things change, which is, uh, it's a, and this is available on our website. Um, and additionally on our website, we have our substance misuse coalition resource list and our mental health resource list, which has a great overview of some of the either substance use or mental health options available in our community and in our area. 
Um, also, Respond Inc. is a nonprofit domestic violence organization which has partnered with the Reading Police. So there is a, an advocate who is typically, or pre-COVID, she was stationed at the police department two days a week. Um, Respond has a 24-hour hotline for people who are looking for more specific domestic violence support. And then there are additional resources to support the families of people who may be struggling with addiction or with a mental health concern. And then of course, the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline, which is a great resource in helping people connect to a substance use treatment. So all of these resources and more are available on our website. And as we mentioned before, you know, this is it, it's a lot of information and sometimes people don't totally know exactly what they're looking for. So we always encourage people to reach out to us directly. We are always happy to help as best we can kind of talk through an issue and see if we're able to do some of that matchmaking support and help people get to the appropriate clinical provider. So awesome. thank you so much. Thank you folks. You are a tremendous resource to the community. I am, um, amazed at the number of folks that have already taken advantage. Um, but I know also that this is a resource that's available for anyone who feels that they need some, some assistance. This is the, the uh, website is best accessed by the Reading Public School website. Is that right? Yes. To get to and you folks. The, the link is at the top of your screen and you can link through the town website as well. Great. And mine and Erica's contact information is also available on the website. So anybody with questions or concerns, you know, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Awesome. I had the chance to, to see part of the Mystic Valley uh, presentation at their annual meeting, just a, a little part of it, but um, it's very impressive kind of the range of resources that are out there and that are available to residents. And I think that's the most important thing. So if you've got concerns, questions, there are resources right here that you can tap into. Vanessa. Um, I, I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Um, I've seen this program um, grow and expand to cover more areas and to service um, really a vulnerable population in our community. Um, I, it's, it's supportive, it's encouraging, it's positive, and it's everything that you would want in a response to people who are in need. So I, my sincere thanks for everything that you're doing here. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, folks? Thank you um, so much for all that you do. And um, to residents, I'd say, please don't hesitate. Um, it's a very difficult time right now for everyone. And you know, don't hesitate um, to take advantage of these, these resources. They're here for all of us. Carol? Same here. Same here. Thank you, ladies. Um, this is my first. Uh, viewing of, uh, you know, in a meeting uh, of all these resources, and uh, I was a little bit surprised that 308 is not a big number. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but over four years. So uh, I'm, I'm sure um, these presentations help, but uh, like what Ann said, I, I think a, a lot of people might not know about this, so this is very uh, helpful to, to the town. Thank you. Yes, we, we try to promote interface at every opportunity, but there's always folks we run into that don't know about it. We are one of 52 communities that have the service, Winchester, as well as Wakefield and Melrose um, around us have it as well. Um, and about you know 308 over those um, number of years is about average for our surrounding communities as well. But one thing that we noted was um, between March and June, we had 39 families use the service right in the heat of the, the beginning of the pandemic. So we were really thrilled that people were using it, um, especially as telehealth was being rolled out and people were having struggles with getting medication and figuring things out. And so we're really happy to see that people used it during that time. But Interface wanted to let the community know that um, this may be a great time to reach out as, as the a pandemic continues, there's, there's fatigue with everything that's going on and for, for mental health challenges, it can exacerbate things. So you know, reach out, there's resources, there's way more telehealth than we, we've ever had, ever. Um, and it's so much easier to connect with a provider than ever. So we really encourage people to use that as a starting point. Great folks. Thank you again very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, select board members, let's take five minutes. Um, I've got kind of, I've got 926.
we come back right up just 930, just a moment after 930, we'll recess uh, for five minutes and we'll come back and continue with the agenda. Mark, there you go. I think on the tree thing, I think you brought up a good point that was discussed last time that we have to find out if this is under our purview. Yeah, yeah, if there is an option. Um, I know it's frustrating for Ralph, but 
uh, are we the right body? Yeah, I think let's let's talk about how to. This is one a closing one, <laughs> a closing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. I think you're right too. Congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> so, it, oh, I see. Oh, the hyphen. There it is. Okay. I wasn't <laughs> oh, is it a hyphen? I wasn't sure if anyone would know who I was with the new last name. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give us a couple days, please. <laughs> yeah. I'll slowly transition. Yeah. It's a lot of work for you ladies to get married. <laughs> Uh, hopefully the guys are doing about half the work too, so we'll see. <laughs> no, I mean the name change and the license. I, and I, sorry, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. Caitlin, are, did you go on a honeymoon or? Um, we went up to the Mount Washington Hotel for a few days. Oh, nice. So that was really that's that I've never been, but I've heard it's amazing. Yeah, I had never stayed there. I'd been there to like visit oh, cool. and see the sites, but I'd never stayed there. And it's really cute. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. That's how you back. We don't have you on uh, video yet. Try a text. There we go. Awesome. Okay, we are back in session. That was my gavel striking, back in session. <laughs> um, so let's, the next uh, topic for us is to look at the stretch code bylaw. Um, and Karen, I'm gonna ask for your, your assistance with this also. Last meeting, we talked um, briefly about what is being asked um, in terms of the, the stretch code. It does require a bylaw change. Um, in fact, in David's slides that he was just showing, we got some of the more updated information on how uh, most communities have already uh, adopted this. The, the way to do that would be um, for us to uh, bring it forward to town meeting. So uh, putting it into this warrant, it would go forward to town meeting for uh, obviously a complete discussion there of what's involved. Um, and with town meetings approval, um, then it, it goes forward. It is by itself a, an important goal for sustainability and if there is gonna be a move toward green communities, it's one of the requirements as well. Did I kind of capture that reasonably well, Karen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, first question, I think, are there any questions, any other questions related to kind of, first of all, what the stretch code is, and then second of all, what we are, uh, what we would be voting on tonight when we make a motion? Can I make a uh, clarification? Mark, if it's helpful, I have a draft of a bylaw from town council. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, Karen, go ahead. But uh, Bob, can you put it up on the screen? All right. Well, beef, Mark, I'm um, sorry, Bob, is what you're going to put up different than what was in the packet? You know, honestly, I don't remember that it was that it was in the packet. The packet from last meeting or this meeting? When I was going through today, which I believe was for tonight there. Yes, I was going to comment that um, I can't comment about the beginning, the 710 through 710.12. I, I assume that's straightforward. Yep. Um, and also 710.3. But the purpose, 7.10.2, I know this is a draft. I'm not sure where those numbers came from. I don't, I don't, there's no restriction of 3,000 square feet for new construction. It's just all new residential construction. So I, I, I'm not sure that that, where that came from. And then as you guys saw on the slide that I provided a couple weeks ago, 
the specific rules say that for um, commercial, it would apply to those greater than 40,000 square feet. So I'm, I just, I, I know that's a sample, that purpose there. I, 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 I don't think that is accurate. So that probably won't be what it'll look like. Um, I can share a comment on that. Okay. Uh, if you'll see in 7102, uh, it cites Mass General Law Criterion 5, and this is a, a strict legal citation. This is what's in there. But then in 7103, yeah. um, in the discussions that the town did not wish to, uh, you know, use the $3,000 cutoff, I'm sorry, 3,000 square foot cutoff, for instance, it just says down here, all, you know, all construction. So the actual bylaw is not using the 3,000 square foot number. It's just, that's just a citation in the law. So why would that be in there? Because that it's referring the actual law that's on the books. I mean, maybe it doesn't have to be, but. Yeah, I'm not sure it is. I just, uh, okay. I, I, if you want, I can follow up on that. That's the first I've heard of that. I don't think it specifies any kind of square feet. I think it's just. Yeah, town, town council worked with, I don't remember the fellow's name, but the fellow you guys were working with, he, they work with him directly. I'm not saying this is his suggestion. I'm just saying they had a pretty thorough discussion. Beyond that, I'm not sure. I thought I read somewhere in the packet that what we're voting on tonight is not the link. That's link correct. Yes. That, just, that, yeah. you know, we'll get further uh, yeah. edits from town council. But, but certainly if you folks have guidance, um, you know, you're going to be voting on the actual language in two weeks. Not to say it can't be modified on town meeting floor, but you know, whatever your intention is, is what the wording should be. So if you have questions that I can direct back to town council, I'm happy to do that. So we are going to vote, sorry, we are voting on specific language in two weeks. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll take it as a to-do to, to follow okay. that purpose because that was, the, everything else looks pretty boilerplate. Yeah, and just um, to fill in this last part here, um, if you're going to bring it to November town meeting and town meeting approves it, and then it has to go to the attorney general. Um, this is something that does not take effect until the attorney general approves it. Um, whereas there's some zoning that takes effect as soon as there's a public hearing. Um, so there'll have to be some discussion about what date to put in there. Um, uh, Ray and I discussed it uh, a little bit with Gene for the, from the building department perspective that July 1st, 2021 was probably the most practical date. Um, the Attorney General typically has not been approving things for, say, 90 days, 120 days. Uh, it's hard to know with the pandemic. And um, what we don't want is all of a sudden on an arbitrary day, you know, May 3rd, then all of a sudden the building cone changes. And depending on whether, you know, there's projects in the works or not, there could be a change. Now, obviously, uh, should town meeting pass this in November, we'll advertise this to all the builders and most of the builders know about this, so it shouldn't be a big deal. But we just wanted to make it a cleaner implementation time and not in the middle of the heaviest spring construction season. Um, but again, that, that's a date that you folks can put in, um, you know, any date you want, but it will not take effect until the AG has approved it. Okay. okay. I, I would comment that this should go into effect as soon as the AG signs it. Um, I would specifically hate to miss an entire an entire year of planning in our community, but we can certainly tell everyone if town meeting agrees that this is a good thing to do and it's going to the AG, as Bob suggested, we can certainly advertise it. And since 283 other communities have already adopted it, like it's it's not that big of a deal. Oh, it would make sense to make it effective upon ratification by the attorney general's office. I think I can support that as well. Okay. So this is, I think, by the way, it's also page 56 of the packet. So any, first of all, any questions about what's here and, and what was to, to kind of uh, cover the ground one more time. The, there was a lot of discussion between uh, climate action uh, bylaw committee 
um, and us about who should sponsor this for the warrant. And um, the Climate Action Committee felt very strongly that the Select Board would be a much better group to do that. Um, the Bylaw Committee um, kind of deferred a little bit and hoped, I think, that the Select Board would approve it. I think that's the right way of putting it. Um, and so, so now it's here for us to make that decision. And then um, if, well, whatever, assuming it, it, we were to approve it this evening, um, it would become a warrant article that we would then be putting in for the warrant, which we vote on at the next meeting, which is in two weeks. So that's kind of the process from here. And then obviously to town meeting from there. So any other questions on you know, what we have here so far? Go ahead, Vanessa. We're not hearing you. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm happy to support this um, if the board is amenable to it. I I'm curious, I understand that there needs to be a single sponsor, but is there anything to say that the warrant can't also indicate that um, bylaw and climate are uh, also in favor of it, just so that it you know, presents clearly that this is um, widely accepted? And, um, has many sponsors. Bob? Yeah, um, certainly that can be indicated and, and would be indicated in the warrant report. Uh, the bylaw committee and FinCom are generally required to give an opinion to town meeting on things in their jurisdiction, um, but that's different than sponsoring it. You know, um, approving it or recommending it is, is not the same as sponsoring it. And I, I didn't go to your meeting with the bylaw committee, so I don't know their feelings on that. Certainly, um, we can include a report from the Climate uh, Advisory Committee if they also wish to make a recommendation, just like we do for FinCom and the Bylaw Committee. And again, if they wanted to jointly sponsor it, I don't really see a problem with that. Uh, but it is up to you know those individual bodies. Yeah, we will have to ask them. <laughs> um, I, I mean, if, if they're interested, it might be a nice touch. Yeah, let's say, I, I think climate advisory is, is a no-brainer. I'm not sure uh, whether the bylaw committee, obviously they'd have to bring it up at a meeting and see what's up, but sure. Any other questions, comments? All right, I do have a motion here. Oops. Sorry, I have one too many screens. <laughs> Um, I'd like to say you're doing a great job. You haven't kicked any of us off ever. That's awesome. <laughs> so far. <laughs> um, so, Carlo, can I ask you to read? This would be now the second motion here. Yep. Move to sponsor an article at upcoming town meeting to amend the bylaws to add the stretch energy code. Is there a second? And Karen seconds, thank you. Any further discussion? None appearing. Uh, let's take a vote. So Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Five zero, thank you. All right, let's go back to agenda. Mark, we could either do the rest of the town meeting warrant or, or the town manager's goals, whatever you prefer. Um, I'm, I'm fine, just why don't we do the, the goals? That keeps us in order in the packet. I, I, made, I make notes in the packet. It's easier for me to kind of stay in order if we can. <laughs> okay, town manager goals. So, Sorry, the picture of Erica and Sammy. Let me just get past that. Great. So this is, I've got it as page 69 in the packet. Is um, so, so we, we've kind of, we've had a, a, a few iterations here. We, we started out, Bob kind of came back to us with um, some suggestions in terms of goals. Um, when we did the retreat and the follow-up discussion at the following meeting, um, we, we talked about some priorities and then we discussed that we might 
uh, we want to make sure that we incorporate priorities and thoughts into the town manager goals for fiscal 21. Uh, Bob did uh, take a look at kind of what he had sent before um, and updated some of the things that are here as well in terms of you know, what the goals were and what, what's incorporated there. What I think would be helpful tonight is for members to kind of share um, where they have ideas, questions, comments in terms of, of what these should be with the goal, the, the goal being that we can formalize this, hopefully even at our next meeting that we can turn this, you know, we can talk about it tonight. Um, Bob can give some consideration to what we're talking about as well. And then we formalize that into um, the goals document and go forward from there. So I would open the floor. Who, who would like to make comments first? I would be happy to make some comments if no one else does. <laughs> Is it helpful if I just put this up on the screen? Oh, sorry. I'm. Uh, all right, so I'm one screen light on that right now. Um, let me let me if I could go through my notes. Yeah. Um, so on goal number one on community conversations, um, my suggestion is that we kind of broaden this to kind of community outreach. So that conversations are certainly a piece of it, but I think there are some other things um, that would be great. More, I'm going to call them listening sessions. Uh, perhaps town staff and volunteers. Um, might even participate in some of those meetings, not to change it from a listening session, but sometimes to offer some, some, some thoughts on, on what's happening. So it's not just kind of, hey, what do you think? It's almost like, hey, here, here's, here's what's happening. Here's what we're thinking. Now we're interested to hear what you think. And I just wondered if, if we just do a few sessions, that's not gonna work. But if we had more sessions, that might be an opportunity to, to allow staff to go out and talk about some things as well. Um, the key here, sorry, I'm reading my notes on the opposite screen. Uh, key is to understand community needs and separately start a discussion on priorities. So I, I, I don't want to try to overdo what happens. I think it's a stepwise process. I think we've got to hear more about what's going on and then use that to kind of understand priorities and take them forward. This wraps into some of the other goals that we talked about also where capital right now maybe isn't the right thing to think about in 21. Capital projects, new buildings, things like that. And more so it's understanding the needs, doing programmatic changes as needed and allocating resources in that direction, um, at least until we learn a little bit more about the kind of post COVID world. So do you want me to go through kind of all, I have a few other comments, do you want me to go through all? Okay. Can I just um, ask you a question on that, Mark? Sure. Um, I, I think I started hearing one thing and then I ended up not hearing that. Oops. Is this, is this more of a listening session like the overrides discussions were in terms of, at first I thought the staff was presenting ideas to the public for reaction, but then I wasn't so sure. And I, I was, we were listening to the public as to what services are, you know, they may need. I, I suppose it could work either way, but there is a difference. Yeah. And this, this may be one that, that's more of a both kind of answer. As I thought about it, I think that a lot of it is straight listening, um, you know, more like the the the, um, the community conversations. But I, I started to think that maybe it would be helpful to have um, a little bit of a talking section also. And I didn't want to put them together necessarily because I think the first one does a great job. I'd love it to get to more people. I also would like to see how we transition that to understand the near-term as well as long-term priorities. Near-term priorities might be what kind of services we want to be offering now. You know, what, what do we need to do now? As well as the longer-term kinds of things. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to kind of stop the conversation aspect and change it. Rather, I thought, no, it's, it's an and. It's conversations are great. That's kind of one activity. And then maybe there's another kind of um, activity that it's a bigger forum. It's not meant to be Kind of a room at the library it's it's meant to be um you know a, a, what may be a big zoom at this point sorry but kind of gathering more people so you detected correctly i wasn't sure how to play it other than to expand it okay thank you um on sustainability i think that that captures a lot of what's going on um i would like to talk more about um, as we talk about parking, about charging stations, um, the opportunity for electric vehicles into the town fleet, 
and more partnership and, and activities with RMLD. I thought could all be there. I think that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap with some of the RMLD things, and, and obviously they need to do it for all their communities, and that's fine. But um, I think that there's they're indicating a willingness to do some stuff, and, and I'd love to take advantage of it. Um, I, I advantage in a good way, obviously. <laughs> um, economic development retention. So I, I applaud this completely. My only comment is that I think it's both survival and thriving not just retention. So it, the, the, the first step is to make sure we get through this. It's the new grants and things like that. And then there's an element of thriving. And thriving could be related to the downtown committee uh, that's under discussion. Uh, it could be a lot of things that kind of help, you know, not just you know, stay there, but build and grow. What other things can we do to encourage people to shop in town? That kind of stuff. And again, that's much too much in the weeds. But that's retention felt like not enough. I, I wanted it to be more expansive. Uh, economic development expansion. The one question here is I don't know where the, the uh, Camp Curtis possibilities exist at this point. I know obviously things have changed. Um, how they've changed, I'm not really sure. Um, if it's still a possible activity. Now might be a really good planning time, <laughs> um, but I don't know where that one's at. Yeah, interestingly, I got an email today from the state that um, the National Guard and the Office of the Governor are, are still extremely interested in this, which was a bit of a surprise. So I'm having uh, breakfast with uh, Wakefield tomorrow. We'll chat about where we are. Awesome. And then next week, I'll sit down, I believe, with our conservation administrator, um, as well as some of the planning staff to understand the role of CONSCOM. Awesome, awesome. I mean, this, this, if, yeah, if people are interested, you know, we may bring something to November town meeting that we deferred in the capital plan in the spring and we may put it back on the table. Yeah, and, and the exploration, that, that sounds spot on. That sounds great. Um, number five, COVID-19 impacts and seniors. Um, so one of the things in here is Again, kind of assessing needs and additional services and opportunities that we might be able to bring forward, kind of near term. I, I call it kind of social activities that are not in person. I know that doesn't make much sense, but that's where we are. I'm just scrolling down. Um, number nine on building security. Uh, is dispatch center separate from this completely, or is it actually a little bit of overlap, and should it be included here? Um, this this goal was meant to just be, if you will, the policy paperwork, not the physical construction. Got it. And, and is is dispatch part of that? Is it kind of well, under? It's one? part of the physical project and construction, yes, um, but the governance. Uh, was more the three elected boards um, putting their heads together and seeing what they had in common and what they had as differences. Great. Um, number 10, sorry, I'm just gonna go through these real fast. Um, COVID-19 impacts and um, thinking specifically about um, emergency planning. And I don't know what the backup plan is and I don't wanna hear it, <laughs> but I just wanna know that it's there and it is in kind of a, a protected additional site, I'm gonna call it, um, so that things get even worse um, and suddenly there's an electrical pulse and whatever that, that we aren't you know, all kind of starting at zero. Capital number 11, capital parks and fields. Um, did the, the assessment at Simons already take place or did that get put on hold? The, the conservation assessment. No, Simon's was a, uh, there was four projects. Uh, this is the only one that went forward, the Capitol and Parks. Simon's was a separate one that we could bring back if you're interested. I think it's a good time to bring that one back also. Again, just to understand what's buildable, what's not. Yeah, that one, the CONSCOM clearly had some work to do up front. Um, you know, hiring a, uh, I don't know, someone to survey the land and, and specifically mark it out, a wetland scientist probably. 
Yeah, and, and that's a, I think during COVID sorts of activities, those can definitely still take place. So maybe, sure. okay. I, I, I think those, those should go back. Um, Capitol Buildings number 12. Let me just read my note, make sure it makes sense. I'm sorry, I'm leaning over to the other screen here. Okay, so on this one, you know, given COVID, given where we are, um, it's less capital building activity, I think, in fiscal 21. So I'm wondering if we can turn this more into back onto this community outreach for needs where we can utilize existing facilities and resources to offer other, other activities. So not construction, I'm, I'm repurposing this away from construction of new buildings and more toward activities that could take place. And those are all my comments. I'm sorry, there were so many. Who's next? Vanessa. Um, I, I'll go next because there's several I want to build off of what you already mentioned. Um, and I think uh, they may not necessarily fall into the pre-existing goals as we've defined them. So I'll, I'll lay them out there and, and see what the board, um, how, how they might fit. Um, on sustainability, you know, Mark, you hit a lot of the points. We had David's presentation earlier. I think one of the things that I'd like to see is regular updates, whether it's monthly, whether it's semi-monthly, whether it's quarterly, um, to provide the board and the public with progress on um, advancing these sustainability efforts. So, uh, you know, I'd love, I know, um, you know, Joe gave a presentation, I think it was last year, about some of the initiatives that the town had taken. I found that very informative. I'd love to see an update on that. Um, you know, we, last year, um, I had asked Bob to have quarterly PTTF meetings. Um, three, right? Yeah. So, you know, and so now we have that quarterly, they come in um, every few months to talk to us and we're able to address parking or, or traffic concerns that, that residents have. Um, I think a regularly planned meeting for some for issues around sustainability would be um, instructive. Um, you know, one of the things that's been raised is communication um, and closing the loop with residents. So there are often times when residents reach out to us we um, respond, but we also redirect to Bob or the staff, um, and we're sort of missing sort of the closing of that loop. Um, so it would be nice, perhaps, as part of the town manager report, um, if there's some kind of tracking system that says, you know, the board had six questions this month, and this is the status of them, um, or this is how they were addressed. Um, just so that the board is informed, as well as the public, um, because that it allows the public to know that we are responsive to their issues and, and the concerns that they raise. Um, I think more broadly on communication, um, you know, I think it, it would be nice to have a more cohesive plan for communicating to the full board. Um, I, I sometimes feel a little out of the loop. Um, you know, the chair and the vice chair, I know um, from having done it last year, spent a lot of time talking to Bob. Um, but it seems, you know, I, I'd like that to change in a way that the, the other three members of the board um, can be equally well informed. Um, uh, okay. Um, So this is a delicate one, so I'll, I'll tread carefully. Um, I have heard um, I have heard complaints from residents about a particular department within the town um, of a that involves a particular staff member. Um, Bob, I, I've raised this before. Uh, I, I won't say which one it is because, again, it's a personnel matter, so I want to be careful here. Um, but when issues like this arise, we need to have a way to address them. This is ongoing, it's long-term, it's consistent, um, and it's problematic. So 
how do we as a board being sensitive to the fact that it's a personnel issue address this as bob and make it a priority for what's happening within this particular department um you know maybe that's an executive session discussion i'm not sure um but i'm raising that because it it, it hasn't gotten better um uh the health department has experienced some employee retention issues over the last several years, um, and as we continue to move through the pandemic, um, the high turnover in this department is concerning to me. I know we've talked about employer retention more broadly, um, but this particular department is so critical right now. Uh, I'd like to make sure that Bob has whatever resources or whatever support to make sure we are adequately staffed. Um, and, and this expands to include the Board of Health and that they've been doing a tremendous amount of work in the last uh, you know, six, seven months um, due to potentially staffing issues there. Um, so I, I would like to see employee retention, but within the health department specifically to be a goal for this year. And um, again, Mark, to build on yours for capital projects, Simon's way, you know, I, now is a good time to be planning. It's not a good time to be building, but it's if we plan now when we are, we and the state are in a better financial situation, we'll at least know what we can do there. Um, as far as a goal, I would want uh, the Conservation Commission to be very active in that conversation. Um, and more broadly, I, I don't have a specific answer here, but. Um, you know, I am concerned about our seniors. The pandemic has been going on for a very long time. They are disproportionately affected. Um, and I'd love to continue, you know, I love the phone calls that the town staff made um, to, you know, hundreds of seniors in town. Um, you know, what more can we be doing? We, we aren't the only town dealing with this. Um, but I'd like to make sure that this is a, a demographic that gets the support they need, right? Always, but but especially now. So those are mine. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Vanessa. Others, any other comments? Ann? I, I do. Um, I, um, the communications issue is partly on me with respect to uh, working with Bob to come back to the board with the communications policy. And it's something that I, uh, mentioned in our retreat as something that I'm committed to doing um, and, and am committed to doing. Um, hope to get to that um, soon, this fall. <laughs> so um, now, so Bob, I noticed in your description of the community conversations, one member of the board has expressed an interest in expanding this goal beyond that of the library trustees. Was that in reference to my comments at the last time we talked about town manager goals? I wasn't sure if the, the one board member was me. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, you may have said things, but I remember Vanessa specifically uh, wanting to expand the goal to beyond what it currently was. And, and tonight, Marcus mentioned it, so I, I think it's a comment. Okay. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, the library trustees have their own set of goals and right, you know, right. it can be a part of a bigger one, but we can't make them change it. Right. Um, so I have some suggestions. I talked the last time we'd, we'd raised um, time manager goals about um, incorporating equity and racial and social justice within the goals. So. I could see them as falling within um, both community conversations and um, employee attraction and retention or being a standalone goal. However, um, you might see that framework working. Um, so the last time we'd spoken, we talked about, you know, having not just sort of thematic goals, but some concrete measurables. Um, so I did some thinking about what that could look like um, and some suggestions I had um, would include, you know, continuing the work that we've done together 
um, around the ad hoc committee and working to you know, bring that uh, proposal to life. Obviously that involves a lot of other players, um, the library board of trustees and town meeting, um, but you know, continuing to, to lead on that. Um, we could have, I was thinking um, that the town could sponsor a couple of celebrations um, looking out to June. Um, there is a new state holiday um, that's been declared by the state uh, Juneteenth. It's certainly not a new holiday, holiday celebrated um, by Blacks in America, but it is a new state holiday. Um, and I thought it's, it would be possible for the town of Reading, like we celebrate um, Mem uh, Memorial Day or Veterans Day or MLK Day, um, we could add Juneteenth to sort of our repertoire, whether and whether um, you know HRAC takes that on or the new Reading Alliance, as envisioned uh, under the ad hoc proposal. Um, that that's one idea, of something that could be a measurable. There was um, a group of residents, I think, who spontaneously brought together a celebration on on the town uh, lawn, a town hall lawn this year. Um, Another, another event looking um, again to June would be um, a pride celebration, specifically the raising of a rainbow flag. It's something our neighboring communities do. So I'm specifically thinking about the city of Woburn and the, and the town of Wakefield. I know that they at least have a, a, um, have a pride flag um, raising celebration every year. Um, starting when I'm not, I'm not certain, but they certainly have been doing so in the last couple of years, at least. Um, uh, with respect to employee um, retention and recruitment, one of the things we talked about actually in the context of the ad hoc committee was um, looking at that position and positions within the library, uh, the challenges that um, we we sometimes have in writing and in, in recruiting a diverse applicant pool, um, but there, there are um, another um, advisor, I think Chris Kelly had from the, from the school department had mentioned that there are certain networks that can be tapped into through HR um, to re recruit diverse applicant pools. But um, that's probably a conversation to be had with, with Sean about um, recruitment practices. Um, this kind of falls outside um, the equity and racial and social justice lens, but back to the community conversations topic, just thinking um, about um, thematically um, building bridges and repairing divisions in town. And that's something certainly I, I personally would um, like the select board to partner with you, Bob, in doing. And I, I mean, all of this I see as kind of a partnership with the board and the town manager and um, our different uh, staff and volunteer base. So, thank you. Can I add a quick comment on that just for a second? And then I, I wanna hear from other board members too. I think that um, that's a great point. And one of the things that I don't have the answer for, but something that's a discussion. If you look at, um, Bob, the, the um, the teams, essentially, I mean, what are they called exactly? The uh, the working groups, and in which are there items there where you would appreciate board input, a board member's input, uh, perhaps as part of the of the group. I, I, that's a lot to, to to mention, and I just wanted to kind of bring it up because there may be some where there's some help that could be. Um, you know, brought into that activity, and others where I probably would imagine you'd say, you know what, let me let me work that through staff, and then we'll bring it back to you. But I just wanted to kind of open up that as a as a just as a thought at some point. Yeah, there's absolutely been goals that are I guess lend themselves better to your participation and your help. I'm just looking at the list: building security governance got to be on the top of the list. That should be yours. It shouldn't be mine. So, and then there's I'm sure there's elements of most of these things that would you know, be similar. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're all, we're, we're, we're busy with many things and we're not trying to add burden. We're, we're trying to add assistance. Um, and there may be some that, that we decide, yeah, that, that's, that could be good in others. 
Yeah, and, and seven and eight um, are your policies. So when you're talking about yeah. personnel policies, for instance, uh, that's your article six. So, uh, you know, you absolutely should have a strong hand in that one. And that's why your guidance tonight is helpful. Cool, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to usurp. Uh, Carlo, Karen, any, any other comments you folks would like to make? I'll take a go at it. And this is my first go around at this. So I appreciate uh, Mark, Vanessa, and Anne's input. And to what Mark said at the beginning, I think for community conversations or community input, obviously we have two town meetings a year and we have an elected town meeting body. But I think it would be helpful to have a meeting before at least each town meeting for any resident to voice, ask, um, vent, uh, whatever the case is, because you know, even though we all belong to a precinct and there's precinct captains, and but how do you get to those people unless you know them personally or a neighbor knows them personally? But I think it's helpful, like when we have a financial forum or we have a downtown parking forum, that you know anyone is welcome. It's a lot different now with. Uh, Zoom as in person, but I think we're last year, uh, last town meeting, the April that was in June, where we had like a uh, get ready for town meeting type of session and the kinks were worked out. And now we've gotten past that. It'd be nice to have a, you know, early November non-town meeting meeting, but you know, anyone's welcome just to get more input and different perspectives. As I know we all have our network of friends and neighbors, but you know, town meeting is a finite percentage of the population uh, of our town. But I think it'd be what, to what Mark said, it'd be helpful to get, whether it's quarterly, uh, but at least before a town meeting. So we can talk about warrant articles. We can talk about what's going on and what's proposed. Uh, Cause some things, you know, even for me, I get caught off guard when something comes up that I probably should know about uh, and I don't, and, and I'm a select board member. So I think the town feels that way too, sometimes on some issues, not every issue, but um, but as far as what you three discussed already for the town manager goals and our goals, I, I think everything was well said and I support all of them and any other recommendations uh, that were made tonight, I think you know, I would fully support, so, and it's, you know, it's gonna be a long process, but I think if we get some measurable things, uh, like Vanessa said on the, the climate and sustainability, or right? can we, when will the first EV station be installed, let's say, or when, you know, when is the first new construction building gonna be more green than the previous, once we adopt green communities, that's you know, down the road, but uh, simple things too, um, how do we get the, public to recycle more, repurpose more, uh, take advantage of the drop-offs at, at the compost for, for electronic equipment and batteries and stuff in our house. I know that's all done already, but you know, like for our cast tonight, that, I mean, the Reading Coalition, that presentation tonight was very helpful for me personally. Um, but I think how helpful is that to the rest of the town and how can we promote that more, not just once a year? So stuff like that. I think is important. Um, I know we, we're busy and we all have jobs and families, but I think it's a service that we need to provide as a board, um, other than social media to have, I know we're gonna try to do better job on office hours and stuff like that, but I think uh, that would be helpful. So that, that's my two cents. Awesome, thanks Carla. Karen, you're on the spot. All right, thanks. Good. Well, you know, you guys already had some wonderful ideas. Thank you for letting me listen. Um, I, I <clears throat> this is my first time doing this as well. Um, my first thought is that there's too many goals here. Bob, what do you think? <laughs> there's not too many goals. There's just not enough time. Okay. No, it's, it's, well, you're being diplomatic. <laughs> well, it's going to come down to prioritization and and how much um, you know unexpected things like COVID, you know, distract us. Right. 
So I like the idea, um, I'm gonna build off of what um, y'all have already said. Um, I like the idea of tying metrics to goals. Um, and I like the idea of expanding, let's say number one, community conversations. Let's, let's define if that's gonna include some of the racial justice things that Ian has suggested. And let's put some metrics under there. How do we know where we're making progress? Um, sustainability is, is a big one. Um, so here's where I was struggling with. So sustainability, it can be a very, it can very be a very big thing. So it's helpful that we have a sustainability plan. I like that the working group includes facilities planning and engineering because those guys are driving a lot of decisions and we need them on board with the sustainability plan and looking for low and no carbon footprints and thinking about things a new way. So that makes sense. Um, and getting back to, I believe what Mark touched upon, <clears throat> what role does RMLD play in our sustainability? Can we expand on this particular goal so that we can build a new relationship with them this year and, and really spell out you know, how we can collaborate them? There's so many areas, uh, again, Carlo mentioned, when are we gonna see the first EVs? And um, I would echo Mark's earlier comments that they're pretty much getting to be something that our MLD could frankly give away to win new business, um, the chargers uh, themselves. Um, but small cell is an issue that we need to talk about. Um, they need to be brought up to date in our sustainability plans. Um, and the MVP planning, you know, that should be part of our sustainability. And then David tonight brought up CPA. So I would love to see sustainability. And we can't do everything in one year. I totally understand that. Can we put some metrics around sustainability and, and green communities? I didn't even mention that. So we're making, we've been working very hard. Staff's been working hard. And, and tonight we decided to put the stretch code on the warrant. So we're making progress. And these are things that we can track. Um, so that's what, for both of those items, and in fact, any of these that we keep, I need to see metrics, and, and and Carlo alluded to this as well. Um, specifically, I uh, on three and four, I ag I agree with Mark that we really need to focus on retention this year anyway. So I didn't know if three and four could be combined into one goal, and you know, and then you only have one working group, and and maybe it's more heavily weighted to retention. Um, the charter and general bylaw updates, I, I see that as a lower priority personally. Um, as And seven and eight, I'm not sure those need to be broken out as separate priorities with separate working groups. And and you guys can argue with me on that. Um, um, building security, since it's so top secret, I, I can't really comment on that. <laughs> um, this, did I miss the one on seniors? I'm gonna, I'm gonna echo a few of my colleagues. Um, let's focus on making sure um, that we're reaching out to, sen to seniors in new ways. We've lost um, a community center um, that they can go to. Um, so, and, and again, um, just as long as we can sort of define, you know, what are the kinds of things we're gonna do and that way we know, you know, next year, whether we were able to make progress or whether we had some other um, roadblocks thrown in our way. Um, and capital uh, parks and fields, I know there's been an ongoing initiative and I know we need to make sure that conservation is a huge part of the Birch Meadow planning. And with people staying closer to Reading this year because of COVID, I think that is a smart place to put our priorities. And I would agree that buildings are probably not gonna happen this year. So I, I would say that's gotta be a lower priority if you keep it here. I mean, ultimately, I think 12 is too many goals. I think you could have areas under a few of these goals, um, but 12 seems like a lot. And particularly, I, ha I had a question, are we supposed to, are we asking Bob and staff to focus on these equally or, th or for them to prioritize which ones are the most important or to sort of say, well, we're gonna put 20% of our time into this and 10% into that and not even get to that one. So that would probably help everybody. That's it. Well, I think it's important to note that not Bob, um, as the town manager, doesn't actually do all of these, right? That there are staff under him 
where these efforts are distributed um, and he oversees. So I think, you know, Karen, your point is a good one. 12 is a lot, um, you know, but some of them aren't all necessarily directly under Bob and some of them are. So as we talk about prioritizing them, maybe considering who's doing the bulk of the work for each of these might also be a relevant item. Um, and I missed, sorry, I, I missed two things that I wanted to flag. Um, and thank you, um, Karen and Anne, because you reminded me. Um, one is, um, I think we should have a gender neutral bathroom in town hall. Um, I'd like to have the current spaces evaluated um, and find an appropriate space for one that is gender neutral. Um, this is less of an issue now with town hall being closed. So sort of it's perfect time to make that evaluation. Um, but once town hall reopens, I, I'd like to see that um, take place. Um, we do have um, transgender individuals in Reading uh, and I'd like town hall to be a friendly place for them. Um, and the other item was, um, you know, residential composting as part of our sustainability effort. Uh, Bob, I know you and the staff have done research on this before. Um, you know, I, I think this is where the future of recycling and garbage disposal and, and composting is going. Um, so it behooves us to incorporate this now um, before our garbage and um, recycling costs start to escalate. Um, we've already seen changes in how that's being handled. There will be a cost factor in the future. It's, it's not a matter of if, but when. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. So, Bob, that was a lot of feedback. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting to hear all five of you together. That's really helpful. Um, you know, I, in my head, I got some themes as to what's most and least important, certainly. Um, and, I, you know, I'll work on this in the next two weeks and bring it back to you. Um, something that I think the board should think about when you're thinking big picture, and maybe this is a little bigger than you were thinking. You know, I think back to the charter committee. I think it was a committee. Um, the moderator asked uh, town meeting members to volunteer to be on the charter committee. And he took everyone that volunteered. I, I forget the number, but it was less than 15. And those 15 individuals set a rather large and important policy for the whole town. Now, Granted, town meeting had to approve it, but they were a, a very strong influence in those discussions. Um, you know, and, and as the saying goes, not for nothing, most of them had been around when the charter started. <laughs> so there was a lot, and I had, a, I, I met, uh, I think I met with the last two thirds of the meetings as the staff liaison and the town clerk stopped. Um, there was a lot of focus on the past. Um, the document had to be transitioned into the future because the original charter had a lot of things that they were afraid to let go of. Former elected boards had to be noted in the charter. And so we, you know, we got away from that. But I don't think the charter as a pretty strong document looks too far ahead. And maybe it needs to. And a, and a charter is a three-year process. So it's something that you folks as a board maybe want to start thinking about as to how does the next charter process work? You know, it's supposed to happen every 10 years by bylaw. Um, honestly, I couldn't tell you where it is, but we're in the neighborhood of needing that within the next two or three years. Um, so, you know, I, I thought about this when Carla was talking about the, um, I guess, sort of community pre-town meeting meetings, if you will. Um, you know, this is another way that uh, folks could be in, engaged in a broader, in a broader way, but it would take a lot of work and a lot of thought to help direct people and maybe some of the things you're thinking about as long-term goals really don't belong in a charter. They belong somewhere else. But I just sort of throw that out, um, that the past two charter efforts have been quite different than most of what you're discussing. You know, and I, I'll, I'll just conclude, you know, whether there's a lot of goals or a few, um, just keep in mind, these are the town manager's goals. So when you start bringing in outside agencies such as RMLD, I can't tell RMLD what to do. I can talk to them, I can engage with them. 
Um, you know, we've had this discussion in the past more with schools when there was an issue that the town and schools would collaborate on. And I would just remind you that, you know, I'll do the town manager's piece. Um, but if they're going to do an early, uh, or, sorry, an, 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 an elementary school space study, I can't do that. So, you know, you've given me um, plenty to think about. I'll try to organize it. And um, I might try to prioritize it. You know, my thinking is um, one or two of these can probably just go away um, for, the, for the year. Just thinking, you know, of purely FY21. But, you know, goal number four, economic development expansion, we don't have to do a lot in FY21, really, because we're too busy with goal three, but we can't just let it disappear because <laughs> it's a two or three year process. So I'll try to find a way to give you more information on how we're going to emphasize different goals because they wouldn't be equal. You know, th right now three is much more important than four. Mm -hmm. So I'll, um, I'll do my best to put this together for your next meeting. I have a, we have a department head meeting on Thursday. I might, uh, you know, kick some of the ideas around with the other department heads. I saw Karen's hand first. I was just going to comment that um, I definitely understand that you do not um, have a direct report on RMLD, and I would like to pledge I will give you as much support as you need. I know where all of those commissioners live, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're they're answering. They're still answering our phone calls. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a, a, just a couple points, picking up on what, some of the things my fellow board members said. I think I might diverge a little bit from Karen in not including buildings among this year's priorities. I don't know how much time needs to be put into long-term building projects, but I think we have some significant ones on the horizon and I don't think we can to totally neglect the conversation this year. I think you know COVID-19 certainly derailed any real conversation about it for this year. And I think that I mean, makes sense. We were in, and you were in crisis management mode, but I think we do need to think about um, long-term um, building needs in this in this upcoming year. Um, and then I just, I, it's not that I disagree with the with um, the importance of offering a gender-neutral bathroom, but I want to make just make clear for ev to everyone that um, everyone has a civil right to utilize. Um, the bathroom that uh, accords with their gender identity um, that and so and if we did have a gender neutral bathroom anyone could use it whether they were male female whether they were transgender or cis you know that that's um, you know gender neutral bathrooms are not the the place that only transgender people can go and etc so just wanted to make that clear for everyone Thank you for that, Anne. Ready to wrap on this one? Okay, great. That was a very good discussion, folks. Uh, very good. Very good getting that going. Um, let's do a spin through the warrant, Bob, if we could. This is page 73 in your packet. I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, this is really all the leftover. Well, the, for the first three articles are required by charter uh, and the rest uh, by and large are leftovers from annual town meeting. Let me just go down through them quickly. Um, yeah, all, all of them were um, on the warrant in April. So, you know, partly because boards and committees haven't met as much this summer and, and by design, CPDC and ZBA had no, nothing planned for November town meeting. So only the, um, the article you've decided on tonight would be sort of new. Um, I've been in touch with the moderator. Uh, let me share, I, I sent out a letter from the moderator today. Um, I don't think it's important we go over it other than his recommendation 
is to use the same approach and technology um, that we used at uh, Springtown meeting because it seemed to draw good attendance and have good participation. Um, I will say that uh, this November warrant is going to require more votes. Um, I don't know that votes on debt authorizations are very controversial and, and offer many amendments, um, but a bylaw, uh, you know, for instance, may. So we'll have to see, um, and I may want to get your opinions, um, you know, as we get closer to town meeting, what you thought the strengths and weaknesses were. Because uh, the town meeting we had in June was um, fairly straightforward, except for instructional motions, there wasn't a lot of debate or discussion. Um, it was everyone knew it was an emergency and, and everyone got right to their business. Um, but if, um, you know, any of these articles were to have sort of more of a full discussion, you know, did the technology work uh, would be a question. So I, I do have, let me just stop sharing. I do have a draft warrant as well that you got. Um, I have not, I have not yet met with Alan. Um, my get, my guess is um, this may not be a one night town meeting. Um, you know, there may be a couple, couple things in there. Um, I will have to get from town council um, the. We may need to add some wording in here um, pertaining to the virtual town meeting. And Mark, to answer a point you made earlier, um, Ivria got back to me and I'll just paraphrase her. Um, we are using um, part of the acts of 2020, I don't remember the number, in order to do what we're going to suggest, but we, we are required to ask town meeting if they will meet virtually on the day of the virtual meeting. And that is different than the annual town meeting requirements last spring. So we have to have a contingency plan that if town meeting is asked uh, to meet virtually on the first night and they decline, there has to be a physical location and a date as a backup. So I'll work with uh, town council and the moderator on that. I'm not suggesting that's a possibility really, it doesn't really make sense, but there are some technicalities about how this town meeting has to be approached differently than annual town meeting was. Um, and, and the approach that, you know, uh, town council has suggested and the moderator has used does not require any further legislation in case any is, is forthcoming. This, this works today. So I don't know if the board has any questions. It's, and where it's old business, generally, it's it's already been reviewed. So the the uh, the debt that's in here, starting at seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. These are um, projects that now need to move forward, right? That we kind of deferred, but now they need to move ahead, and they are. Yeah. Uh, and they're all in the capital uh, plan. Um, yeah. Either they have or haven't been funded, depending on their timing. It's specific water, sewer, and storm. Storm yes. water. Correct. And I, I believe I wrote to the board um, that one of the articles was withdrawn. Um, the revolving fund authorization um, needs to happen with a joint meeting of FinCom and the select board. So as soon as they set a uh, financial form, I'll, I'll certainly advise the board. Um, right now, technically, we have no authority to spend money in many revolving funds. There are exceptions. REC is by itself. <clears throat> um, and that's something we definitely want to clarify quickly because the Board of Health, for instance, um, you know, has some expenditures contemplated. Um, and right now they have no authorization. We just learned that, I want to say, 10 days ago. Bob, you had mentioned, I think, September 23rd as kind of a possible date? I just asked FinCom to consider the 23rd and then a second form on October 14th. So I'll, I'll have to see what their schedules are like. Um, not to get into the finance too deeply, but it's, it's extremely complicated this year. Um, on the surface, um, you know, Ann may know where the printing press is, but the state created a lot of state aid. <laughs> I don't know from what. Um, and then we had uh, a good number in new growth from Victor. Uh, a week or so ago. 
So on the surface, there's some, some good news, but beneath that as to the reliability, the, the new growth is real, that's, that's good. The state aid, I don't know, I don't know what to say. And then I'm meeting tomorrow with Sharon and Andre to talk about our collections to see how they are. Um, you know, we, we survived the pandemic in last fiscal year because it hit at the end and we had already collected a lot of the revenue that was due us. Now that we may have a full year of pandemic, you know, just because, you know, we have, uh, you know, tax bills and water and sewer bills doesn't mean we're going to collect them. So I want to get an update on that and, and as to whether that should influence how much money we spend. So, you know, we're going to go through uh, the fall uh, being generally uncertain. And I, and I would suppose we'll take a cautious approach at November town meeting for spending further money. Uh, but I'm sure I will, I know I will have some suggestions um, on things we could do this year with more money if we had it. So again, that'll all come out in the financial forum or presumably we'll need to. Yeah, it, it, um, it sounds like if it's possible, if the finance committee can make it happen that we should do that discussion in September. Yeah. To, to unencumber things that need to happen. Yeah, and, and I have not talked to John a lot um, in the last two months, which is unusual. He's obviously been busy. I don't really know what the school's needs are. I'm not, I'm not really sure they know what the school's needs are. Um, there's so many changing plans as to virtual, in-person, and so on. Uh, I'm aware of some of the budget impacts. Some of them are, if, if you will, positive, some are negative, but I don't know the whole picture. Um, you know, and we're going to want to have a pretty good financial discussion this fall and lay a reasonable expectation for budgets going forward, I think. Yeah, I don't know if there's been any update, but I, I understood there was a proposal to stop the funding of PPE, um, unless it can be proven to be uh, kind of emergency related. Um, I think that just came flying across from the MMA a week or so ago. And I don't know if that was a, a discussion or, or it's an action, uh, but it was a FEMA directed. Yeah, FEMA has been pretty clear that uh, December is the cutoff. Okay. So I, I haven't heard any news since December is the cutoff. There's been a lot of uh, wishing and hoping that the federal government would provide more resources. Uh, so far, those are not forthcoming. Yeah, so I don't know where our planning was in terms of uh, how much PPE we would need for the, I guess, the second half of the fiscal year. Um, but if it turns out we can't get any more federal aid, Probably yeah, we, we pretty much laid in supplies for a good long time. Good planning. <laughs> Excellent planning. <laughs> Board members, any other questions on warrant? So what we will do is we will vote on the warrant at our next meeting on the 22nd. Um, that's our deadline, so we need to do it. Great. Um, minutes. Let's do minutes. We have two minutes in the packet, two sets of minutes. Um, all right, I need a page help, 79. I had two minor edits, Mark, that I sent to Caitlin. Caitlin, I'm not sure if you got them, I sent them uh, shortly before the meeting started. Yes, I did. Thank you. Thanks. I did not have any edits. Thank you. So I had one one question in the 811 minutes. Um, and it, it asked the board if they think it makes sense. The, on um, page two, under the open meeting law complaint, the second to last sentence, so their intentions were not for the public to not see the meeting, it was intended to limit public interaction. Um, and the, the comment I had to it was, the intention was to allow for more open board comment while still having an open meeting. 
And I don't know if I'm getting too nitpicky or if that is a, a better description. I think that's accurate. I'm good with that. And Carl, so I can, I can. Yeah, that's fine. I was planning to abstain on these minutes since I wasn't present at the meeting. Ah. So, um, no objection. <laughs> Caitlin, do you want me to um, show this screen or just it, essentially it's the second to last sentence under open meeting law complaint. It just deletes it, replaces it with the intention was to allow for more open board comment while still having an open meeting. I want to say that just one more time. Yeah. Um, in fact, the intention. the intention was to allow for more open board comment while still having an open meeting. Got it. I have a minor edit to this as well. Um, for under open meeting law, um, it says the board discussed another open meeting law complaint from Kendra Cooper. I would just say the board discussed an open meeting law complaint from Kendra Cooper. A N instead of another. On um, yeah. I'm fine with that. Vanessa, Vanessa, excuse me, Vanessa, were those your edits or there was more? Uh, that was the only edit I had for that one. I have another minor edit for the other one. Okay, so this one looks okay. Uh, Carlo, uh, you know what? I actually have a motion. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, what screen am I looking for? Ah, PowerPoint, sorry. You don't, you don't need it, I got it. Okay. I'm ready, okay. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of August 11th, 2020. As amended. As amended, sorry. Second. As amended. Second. Karen got the second. Any other comments? Not appearing. Let's take a vote. Carlo? Yes. Anne? Oh, it's abstain. You, I couldn't hear you, actually. You're muted. Abstain. Thank you. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. So we're 401. And the 825 minutes. I have one minor um, edit, which is um, Carlo Bacci moved to adjourn. That's fine. Uh, Vanessa Alvarado seconded it for the purposes of discussion. Um, there's no need to add for the purposes of discussion. A second is just a second. So I would uh, remove the everything after it. I'm fine with that. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, by the way, I should mention, I, I learned something that I did not know, that I did not uh, handle that appropriately. A motion to adjourn should be a non-debatable motion. Oh. It should just be uh, a motion. If there's a second, then there's a vote, period. There's no discussion. Really? Is this a, under Robert's rules of procedure? Interesting. Okay. Robert, Robert's rules of order. It's a non-debatable motion. So I apologize. Okay. I didn't know that. I do now. Well, and so we use Robert's rules of order, but town meeting uses town meeting rules? Town meeting times. Town meeting time. Oh, okay. So, it's, yep. So we need to, Carla, we get to know, we need to know two different sets of rules. Some of them are are are, are similar, um, but not all. In good nest, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't have any comments on on this. Any other questions, comments? No. Okay, Carlo, can you make a motion, please? All right. Motion to approve the minutes on August twenty fifth, twenty twenty, as amended. Is there a second? Second. Good. That's a second. Great. Any comments? None appearing. Take a vote. Carlo? Yes. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Thank you.
Um, and we are on to our last item, which is future agendas. So, uh, the, right, make sure, yeah, future agendas. So, um, the one thing uh, we had talked about doing town manager review at the next meeting, um, we need to move that. Um, not all of the reviews are in, and once they're all in, we said that we would give Bob time to look at them first and in fact reach out if he wanted to reach out. And I think that's a very important thing for us to make sure that we do. So I want to move it to an October meeting. Um, I'd like to ask any folks who have not yet turned in comments to make sure that they are done this week uh, and get them to Sean. And then uh, Sean will share with Bob and um, I think you know we can assess at that point um, you know how much more time is needed, but let's move it. Let's make sure it's it's not on the September 22nd agenda. Uh, it's one on one of the October ones, the sixth, if that works. Um, and you know, I, I think we should target the sixth if that makes sense. Um, so other agenda topics that we want to make sure that we have in there. You can see, I think. Sorry, what page am I looking for that shows already what's on for the 22nd? We know that we have the public hearing on parking. Um, the cell tower will make sure, excuse me, for the 20th of October meeting, that that will be a public meeting. I'm using a public meeting, not public hearing um, purposefully. <laughs> I'm not sure there's something that we would be voting on at that point, but I think it's important to get uh, input. And I, I take the suggestions that many board members made about um, asking uh, some of the proponents, some of the, I guess, opponents to uh, to have some thoughts on who might speak. Uh, I'm just looking to see in the packet we had kind of an out. Did we have an outline for the next meeting? I just want to make sure it's there. I just shared the screen, Mark. Oh, sorry, I'm too busy looking at other screens. Thank you. If they, if we gave them, you know, if there was a designated person representing the opponents, would we be giving them more than two minutes then to make a presentation to us? That sounds pretty reasonable to me. How do other members feel? Yeah. What, what was that again? I, I missed that. Sorry. Um, yeah. If we're encouraging the opponents of the cell tower to designate someone, we would give them more than two minutes to speak, and we would certainly we would take other commentary for, from from other residents who ha who had it. But if we're encouraging them to designate someone, we could give them more than two minutes uh, for a presentation. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Sorry, thanks. Great. Okay, so. Um, if it's okay with the board, I'm happy to speak with some some folks and and uh, ask them for feedback if that's if they feel that would be appropriate and acceptable. My quick question: mm -hmm. um, it, it makes sense that they should have more than two minutes. Um, is this going to be this at this meeting the first time they might hear about some? Um, I don't want to say that mitigating um, scenarios or solutions that staff might come up with. So I think I, I defer, I'm going to defer to you, Bob, but I, I think that it would be great if the staff has had a chance to um, look at some options and uh, have that available in the packet. Does that sound reasonable in that time frame? I really need to understand the objections. Um, I have not seen a wide range of objections from the emails you've received. So if you had an office hour that indicated differently, um, that'd be real helpful. Yeah, let me, I will um, send that across. I would say that the, one of the biggest core discussions was back to the issue of can the equipment be on the water tower? Can the cell equipment be on the water tower? What options are there? Other best practices, other communities? You know, what, what's in the range of possible? Other things that I heard mentioned were the height, uh, the removal of trees, and the proximity to, I suppose, the, the sidewalk and the existing homes on the other side of the plot from where the tower is now located. Um, and the number of cell carriers it could hold. I've heard, and I think we've seen in emails, process concerns um, and a question about 
why not require the cell companies to go through um, sort of the, the formal process versus having the town do it ourselves? So, so I think um, some of the some of the answers to this actually were in the the packet and presentation from that June meeting, mm -hmm. um, but we 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 didn't go through the whole presentation. So we, we we saw pieces of it, and therefore the public probably just covered pieces of it also. So um, some of the information probably already exists, but some of it probably still needs to to come forward too. Yeah, I wouldn't want to assume that these residents um, have seen the presentation, either of them. Um, I've seen two from the staff. So I, I think we need to assume, sort of start the presentation with the assumption that they have not seen anything. All they know is that a cell tower is going up and then build from there. I did speak with some residents who, uh, today who'd gone back through documents of both vi video and packets Back, dating back to 2016. So they had, they'd, they'd in fact seen more presentations than I had. Yeah, there's a July 10th, 2018 meeting also, apparently. Yeah, I think that um, we need to all, as staff, just take a giant step back and present a timeline because there's a lot mm -hmm. of people that are new to this process. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, any, any other topics at this point to bring up? Um, just mark for the town manager goals um, for next meeting. I definitely suggest more than 15 minutes. We can work <laughs> on that though, offline. So since we're moving the town manager review, do you want to allocate an hour? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think based on the discussion tonight, um, I'll do my best at coming up with a draft, but I'm sure the board's going to want to have a discussion. So as much time as it needs. Great. Great. And then, um, so parking right now has, oh, we have an hour and 15 minutes, right? Uh, yeah, yep. we have 15 minutes, great. Okay, um, so I think our goal should be not to add any other agenda items unless they're uh, critical to that meeting. Right. Good, okay. Uh, I would entertain a motion, Carlo. Mark, I actually have just a quick question. Sure. I, I, I was under the impression this is just new to me that the reviews was like a hard deadline. I, I, I didn't think it was a open to interpretation deadline. Yeah, I, I don't think it was meant to be open to interpretation, but I think that the reality of kind of how hectic things are in life, in town activities, in COVID, that we need to have a little bit of flexibility. Um, I did hear back from uh, well, I was a couple of days late myself, um, but I did hear back from Sean that it wasn't completed. And I, I tried to, on a schedule basis, just ask folks, hey, please make sure you get your stuff in. Um, and it's not complete yet, but I think that's that's kind of where we are. Um, I think even if they were in now, it's important that Bob have enough time to go through them and uh, have, ask questions, respond, whatever it's going to be. So I don't want to jam that into the into the next meeting. I don't think it makes sense. Um, had a little discussion with, with Bob about that. I don't think it makes sense to jam it in at this point. It makes much more sense to, let's do the process right from here. Yeah, okay. it would have been great to have it on time, but we didn't. I'm sorry, Ann. I was just saying, Bob asked that we not do it at the next meeting. And I do think it's a, a courtesy to give Bob and each board member the opportunity to, to have a conversation. Um, you know, I certainly would welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with Bob, so. Yeah, that's not where I'm getting at. I'm getting at where's the accountability if they're not all in by next week. I'm just, you know, I'm just asking. I, I think we, what I would ask is that we, those who haven't sent it in, get it done for this week, please. We need it done. We need to move the process forward. Let's make it happen. I mean, yeah, I would hope I would hope that everyone would get it in this week, and if. If they don't, then we do the review based off of those who have, and give people the opportunity to speak with Bob, who have done the review, who have done um, the work. Okay, that's a reasonable approach to it. Okay, ready for a motion? Uh, 
motion to adjourn our meeting on September 8th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> uh, okay, let's take a vote. Carlo? Yes. Ann? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Mark? Yes. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good evening.